Turn me on. Hello, everybody. How's it going? This is Neil with Portal to Ascension. So excited to be with you all. And uh, we are now officially live for the next three days. I'm going to be going live every single day for a presentation on sound and vibrational awareness. And what we're going to do is I'm just going to take a second here and let more people come into the room. Just check in to see who's there right now. Let's get um, a good audience going so we can start from the beginning together. But while I am waiting, I'm going to go ahead and do a poem or two while we're waiting for people to join in here, just as the pre-show. So what we're in for today, everybody, isn't just information and awareness, but it's also entertainment because I like to make everything fun and exciting. And this is truly my passion. And it's really my passion because how interesting and fun it is. So not only am I combining and not only are we speaking about sound and vibration today, but we're combining my two favorite topics, which is sound and frequency and ancient history. So today we look at sound and vibration from the aspect of the ancients, the past. What did they know about sound and vibration? What did they create? The, what did they know about sound that was so advanced that it shows in the structures that they created? So we'll be talking about that quite extensively today. So as where people are joining in, welcome to everybody coming in right now. I'm just going to go ahead and do a poem, and I put the lyrics right up here on um, put the lyrics right up here on the screen so that you can follow along with it. And I think this is a good one because this is about fragmentation, and I split it into three sections here. It's one section is called the void, right? The void. One is the darkness, and then the other one's called the light. So here we go. Fragmentation. In the beginning, there were no words, no concept, no winning, no place, no time, no description, no label, and no finishing, until awareness became conscious of itself, separation from source, no east, no west, no south or north, not to mention there never existed a dimension or ascension or physical lessons, except for the zero point. There was no Christ to anoint. Singularity, energy, frequency raised vibrationally, paradoxically into limitation of what only the five senses can see. No linearity, no anarchy, no galaxies, no nebulae, no jobs, no nature, no materialism, and no political lies until darkness finally fragmented from the light, using free will to see through the night, the darkness. I take the anxiety pill, full of fright, in my bed insecure from the conspiracy that might take over my mind, control me with a chip inside, scared and full of fear. That is the reason why we are here. To the star system of Arcturus, I stare and recite my cosmic prayers. Self-empowered, the fabric of victim consciousness, I tear. The light. The destination has already been chosen. It's the journey that counts. Every day we transcend no doubt, living in the now. Realizing it's a projection of our own co-creation of our own subconscious mind. Channel energy through the heart, remembrance of the divine. Take apart my ego and restart my life in any moment. I'm going home, traveling across the black intergalactic ocean. Took the psychedelic potion, and now I'm awoken. To the streets we take the spoken word. Fly high. Levitate the God inside. I'm free like a bird. Cosmic oneness integrating in my being. A full spectrum being in alignment with the purity confined in, ranges of frequencies inhibit what we are seeing. I shift what I choose to believe in, fuel my light body for the ether I'm feeling, for the ether I'm feeling, for the ether I'm feeling. And that is the official introduction to today. Welcome everybody who has just tuned in with us. We got a good amount of people in here and we're gonna get some more joining us very soon, hopefully. And today's presentation is on sound and vibration in ancient history. And I'm gonna put up a slide here while I go ahead and switch off the, the fan in the other room, just so that I can get some peace and quiet while I'm doing this. So go ahead and take a look at the Crab Nebula and I'll be back in one second. I think I maybe, no, I didn't share it. Okay, anyways, I am back. All right, everybody. So to start off today, let's do this. Let's all start together with a few breaths, okay? Just to synergize and synchronize our energies before we go through 
deep into the rabbit hole today with some pretty profound awareness in regards to our ancient history. So I want to invite everybody now just to get comfortable and relax. <clears throat> to take a few breaths. Now just breathe normally. And now we're going to take three breaths together. So on the next inhale, take a deep breath in, all of us together. And then exhale it through your mouth. <sighs> Another deep breath in. And exhale out. <sighs> and on the next one, feel free to make a little bit of a sound as you exhale. Inhale, deep inhale. Feel it in your soul, feel it in your lungs, in your diaphragm. And exhale out with a little sound. <sighs> All right. Let us begin. Welcome, everybody, to the first day of what is going to be three days of epic awareness. And today, this is actually called the Ultimate Sound of Frequency three-day marathon. That's what I'm calling it right now. The Ultimate Sound of Frequency three-day marathon. You're here on part one of three days. Today, we're going to be discussing ancient civilizations and the use of sound. Now, why I love going live rather than putting on pre-recorded events is because we have the opportunity to interact. And if you have any questions, you can ask them. So. If you have questions at any point, I'm going to take some breaks during this and take a look at the chat, see what you're saying, and integrate it into this presentation here. If you've checked out some of my um, past sound healing events before, there's a lot of similar information. There's a lot of different information. So just take this as a whole and really do interact because that's what I want from this. The reason why I'm going live right now is because I want to have some interaction with you all about these concepts. And I'll also tell you in a second here, you know, my real intention is to get some of you to submit some stories to be a part of my book on sound and vibration. That's my secret agenda that I have for you. I want you to be in my book on sound and vibration and submit your story on sound. And I'll tell you about that later. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a lot of information and awareness. And then hopefully it sparks something within you that makes you be like, whoa, I've had an experience like that. Well, I didn't even realize that this was sound and that actually affected me like this. And not only will it benefit your life and add perspective to your awareness, but you may also want to share your story and be in my book and be a published author. I need 25 people to be in my book. So let us begin. Welcome to the Ultimate Sound of Frequency webinar. And before we officially start with the slides, I'm going to play the video of me inviting you to be a part of this book, just so that you know, you know, that you have the opportunity to, to actually share your story as well. So let me just make sure my sound is selected here. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Neil Gore, and I'm going to be the featured author in the upcoming book on sound. I'm extremely excited about this book. We're going to be dissecting and going deep into the realm and the vibration of the universe and the cosmos and all that is. And I want to know if you have a story that you want to share in regards to sound, in relation to sound. Did you have a mystical experience through vibration that assisted you in some sort of way? Did you ever visit an ancient site or a temple and experience sound and harmonics firsthand. So how has sound affected you? So this right here is an invitation for you to please do share your stories so that we can create this amazing book on sound and not only create a fully encompassing book on what sound and vibration is, but go into what the experience is on the individual level. And the if you want to know more about that in particular, it's actually not only pinned in the comments on YouTube, but it's also in the description. So if you are interested in submitting your stories, obviously there's going to be thousand plus people watching this. Not everybody's going to submit their stories, but uh, if you want to submit your experience and do like an 800 word article for me on sound, please do. It's in the description here. You can see, boom, it's in the comments. And this is my page on sound where you can check the submission guidelines and you can actually 
right there click and submit your stories and that's what the link in the description and the comments go and here's my smiley face and you can learn more about it all right so that's that welcome everybody to what intends to be an ultimate sound experience we're going to go deep into the realm of vibration and here are some of the things that we're going to cover over the next three days. There's going to be lots more than this. This is just kind of like, kind of like just summarizing some of the components. Okay. So we're going to be talking about sound frequency used utilizing ancient civilizations, right? What did they know about sound? How did they know this information? We're going to introduce you to sound healing instruments and toning. Also speaking about chanting, experiencing and meditation practices so even today i'm going to talk about the history of chakras what chakras are because this is ancient civilization so all components com that came from ancient history including vocal toning um and um, chakras are also going to be a part of today's experience and then starting tomorrow is going to be sound the science of sound and frequency okay misinformation also regarding sound and frequency awareness so that we really can use our discernment and sort through all of the stuff that is out there because there is a lot of people making claims without any actual backing or evidence we're going to talk about psychedelics and frequency because guess what all things are sound everything is vibration even psychedelics have a frequency effect because we're not just talking about sound we're not just talking about vibration we're really talking about frequency and many frequencies you can't even hear. So it's a sound, but it's inaudible, right? And then one of my favorite topics, extraterrestrials and sound and frequency. That's going to be there tomorrow as well. And ultimately, the whole reason why I'm doing this in the first place, what does this mean for our future? Why are we talking about this? What can we do with this information? How can we better our lives? And how can we help the world out just by understanding all of this? This quote right here truly says it all when it comes to why I even want to do a presentation on sound in the first place. The forms of snowflakes and faces of flowers may take on their shape because they are responding to some sound in nature. Likewise, it is possible that crystals, plants, and human beings may be in some way music that has taken on visible form. This quote really says it all. We know that snowflakes and flowers are taking on this shape because of some sort of frequency that they're responding to in their seeds, in nature, in the wind. So why would it be any different that human beings, crystals for sure, we can quantify that part, other plants are also music, vibration that has taken on visible form. And as we're going to see, a lot of the ancients believe this as well. Nikola Tesla even said it himself. If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Before we get into the hardcore facts, if you will, let's lay down some ground rules. Because by understanding these ground rules, all of a sudden we can open up to all of this information about that ancient history and how it makes sense. Because to me, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm a healthy skeptic in, in that aspect that I really do like to join the linear world with the creative world. And also, you know, the creative world, the energetic world, the spiritual world, isn't something that is separate from the linear world, they both coexist, except the linear world is what we use to explain everything else, consciousness, you know, the things that aren't even linear, but because the consciousness and energy and all that is real, we can and we are coming to a point where our linear sciences are now proving that this to be the case, that this world energy exists, vibration exists, everything vibrates. So here are the ground rules, okay? We are vibratory energy beings, okay? Yep, on the subatomic level, it has now been proven that you and I, we vibrate our, on the subatomic level. The subatomic level means everything below the atom. So you and I, Below the atom, it's just pure energy vibrating. Next fact, our brains produce electricity. Well, that is true. There is an electrical current that our brain creates. And we'll show that when I get to the physiology of the human body in just a few slides from now. Your brain 
creates this energy, this frequency, and this frequency with this acid in your brain creates this frequency. And this electrical current goes down your spinal co column to your nervous system and then pumps all of your organs in your body. Every organ in your body is responding and awake and active because of the low level of electric electrical current that your brain is creating and sending down your spinal column. Vibration of frequencies measured in Hertz. On earth at this time in our evolution, we, we quantify frequency by Hertz, meaning how many times per second, <clears throat> okay? How many times per second? So if you have 100 Hertz, it's a hundred times per second. The universe is singing and we'll get to that later. I won't go into details now, but that's a ground fact too, meaning it vibrates. Humans have definitely been on Earth for thousands of years more than widely accepted. Too many, too many pieces of information and evidence are coming out that paint an archaeological timeline for humanity or a historical timeline for humanity that goes against what we've conventionally been told. 40 to 50% of all of our events on Portal to Ascension are really about redefining the timeline. So that's pretty much a given. Go Black Tepe, the evidence of uh, Atlantis, the fact that the Sphinx is much older than we've been told, and pre dynastic Egypt goes back into a time where we were told that we were primitive beings. So this is the case, and geological studies and more are proving it to be. But why did I choose sound? This is very symbolic here today, because when I first woke up, part of what I first realized was quantum physics, right? Now, quantum physics has an agenda to it when it comes to mainstream conventional quantum physics. And part of that agenda is why it's still called quantum theory. But quantum physics in regards to the study of the subatomic world, not a part of the actual field of study, even though there are overlaps, really was my introduction to spirituality. But the way I got into it was understanding how extraterrestrials and the um, extraterrestrials were vibrating at different frequencies. And a lot of ancient scriptures were talking about wormholes, dimensions, you know, traveling interdimensionally. And this was all frequency. So understanding the subatomic world and realizing that was a linear science that was true made me understand the spiritual component and get into the ancient history. And then when I started doing that, very soon I became a sound practitioner doing events with sound tools, Tibetan bowls, did reduce all instruments that I'm going to go over today. So it's very symbolic for me to be doing an event on sound or even speaking about it because it really was my foundation into this understanding. Plus today, guys, is my first day of my 39th year of life. Yesterday was my birthday. And um, so I did, I'm did. i doing this event for many reasons. I want to tell you guys about the sound book. I want you to be a part of it. I want to put this information out there. And it's also an affirmation to me as I begin my 39th year of life after having a pretty freaking hectic last six months, let's say, that um, uh, it's just a validation and an affirmation that I'm creating for myself in regards to, you know, why I'm doing this information in the first place. So I'm putting out a lot of awareness just to kind of like really solidify that energy. So I feel that it's a very symbolic moment just to be here with all of you presenting on this today. So why sound? All ancient religions and origin stories talk about sound. So that's one of the reasons. If, well, all the ones that I went through, maybe there are some that don't, right? But if so many ancient stories are talking about vibration and sound in the beginning of it all, then why, why not research why they even say that? The universe is full of frequency. Everything vibrates. That's why. We only hear and see a limited frequency range. And there's countless inaudible frequencies around us always. So if this is the case, my curiosity is piqued. I want to know why we only see a limited frequency range. What's beyond those frequency ranges? And if there's inaudible frequencies around us, I'll give you an example. Let's just talk about the ones that we use radio waves, ultrasound, right? Those are all frequencies. And we are actually using them, but we can't even perceive them. And as I said, when I first got into this, I became a sound practitioner. So it, I feel it's very important to at least give some credit to the sound healing community and industry, right? And the people doing sound healing events. So a lot of you probably have heard of what sound healing is, but let me just go over it anyway. <clears throat> 
Well, like adjusting a piano or tuning a guitar, your body can also be tuned. There are ancient instruments and also now modern instruments we're creating as well <clears throat> to heal and align humanity. Utilizing sound tools will instantly alter your body's biochemistry. It can align your chakras, can align your emotional, physical, and spiritual bodies. And there's been all types of testimonials. And hopefully you have some of these testimonials and want to actually contribute them and quite 800 words for me so I can add it to my book. But they align parts of your body, physical, emotional, spiritual. People have had past life experiences and healing from it all. Um, all types of ailments can actually be fixed and put into alignment using vibration. And some of the benefits of sound healing would be could reduce stress. It can increase the blood flow in the body. It can assist in fully integrating your body, mind, and spirit. Transcend to higher levels of consciousness. Heal dis-ease and enhance immune response. Create an alkaline environment within your body. And one such instrument would be the didgeridoo. And produce data waves. But what are data waves? Well, let's break it down. Here are five different brainwave states. Some of them you've probably heard of. Well, first you have the gamma wave. The gamma wave is the genius brainwave, whole brain activity, higher consciousness, hyper concentration of focus, insights, flow, super learning, mystical out-of-body experiences. So like next level kind of awareness. Then you have the beta wave, which is the linear analytical left brain thinking, right? And so right now me talking to you, even though we're speaking about something beyond, you know, gamma and beyond, it's coming across in a linear analytical way. I'm giving you a presentation information here. So it's, it's, that's the beta wave. The alpha wave is just a step back from that. It's when you're relaxed, your creativity, your visualization, you're daydreaming a little bit. Say that you just took a moment here and you close your eyes. You just breathe a couple of times, you know, and let your mind wander. You would be in the alpha wave. And then we have the theta wave. Theta wave is been um, spoke about quite a lot when it comes to consciousness and spirituality. And in this, this is your intuition, your flashes of inspiration or high creativity, your light sleep. It's vital for self-cleaning of met metabolic brain toxins. So this is meditation, right? So, and you can see here, it, it talks about how it can assist deep meditation, lucid dreaming, trance-like states, access to your subconscious and unconscious mind, healing your trauma. Where does your subconscious, where does your trauma, especially trauma that you don't remember, get stored? In your subconscious, unconscious mind. What happens when you're in a meditative theta wave state? It gives it the opportunity to link up to the frontal part of your brain and allow that to come through in order for you to heal it. And then we have the delta wave. The delta wave is the deep dreamless sleep, deep relaxation, loss of body awareness, accelerated physical healing, you know, so this is like a deeper, deeper state, access to collective unconscious mind, empathy, inner peace, outer body experiences, astral traveling, delta wave. Delta wave, let me just say, is also a good frequency to put on your phone when you go to sleep, if you have problems sleeping, because it'll knock you out. So as a sound practitioner, what would you want to know? Well, you want to know patience because these are sacred instruments and you want to be patient with the instruments, not banging it and trying to get them started, these ancient tools. And intention goes a long way. There's a quote by Jonathan Goldman, and he's like an OG pioneer of Western awareness of sound frequency and ancient sound tools. And he says, intention plus frequency equals healing. The vibration's there. The frequency will do what the frequency does. But without the intention from the person receiving and from you getting it, the frequency can only go halfway. You put your intention with it. If you're having a really bad day, you're doing sound healing on someone, but you have so many bad vibes and anger and resentment or whatever you have within you, your frequency is being amplified and sent out with that sound tool. So having your intention, centering yourself, you know, before you engage with these sound frequencies is only going to assist you. And this is the book that really not kickstarted, but really took my awareness of sound and vibration to another level. It's by Jonathan Goldman called Healing Sounds. I highly recommend it to everyone. And I'm going to show you another book from him. And I also we also have a 30 minute video from Jonathan Goldman on our YouTube channel. So check it out.
And for all the new people tuning in right now, if you want to check out more videos on this awareness, please do go ahead and subscribe, especially if you want to check out sound awareness, meditation. We have lots of videos on that too. So let's get into the chakra system. I'm pretty sure that everybody listening here has heard of the chakra system, right? We have the seven chakras in our body. Then some people say that there's an eighth chakra that's about a foot above our crown chakra. And then some individuals say that we have even more chakras, meridian points in our hands. But let's just go with the seven chakra model, okay? You have the root chakra, which is your first chakra. And that connects to all your lower organs, your legs, your feet. Then you have the... Um, then you have your second chakra, which is the solar plexus, and that is your sexual organs, you know, and it says here, it tells you exactly what they connect to, adrenal glands, testes, ovaries, immune system, and then we have the solar plexus, which is the third chakra, and that's your pancreas, your gallbladder, your small intestines, your stomach, and then we move up to the fourth, which is the heart chakra. And the heart chakra is not just your heart, it's also your lungs, your thymus, your vagus nerve, your upper back, your circulatory system, right? So when we say heart chakra, a lot of people think it's just the heart because it's called the heart chakra. Well, it's all the organs actually in that area as well. And what I'm actually excited about being here with you guys right now is I've done these presentations many times, but I had, I had certain time limits for everything I've ever done. So today there is no time limit. So we're just going to go and speak on every single component for this presentation today, tomorrow, and the next day. Then we go up to the fifth chakra. The fifth chakra is known as the throat chakra, but it also connects to your esophagus, your bronchi, you know, your throat, your thyroid. So it's this whole area right here. Then we have the most well-known chakra that people who don't even know about chakras still know about this chakra, which is the third eye. And that is your pineal gland, your eyes, your ears, your lower brain, and your nervous system. Because remember I told you earlier how the electrical current in your brain is created and then goes down your nervous system and pumps all your organs, right? So that is your third eye. And then the crown chakra, the one right at the top, the pituitary gland, connects you with the divine. It connects you to another level, higher thinking, integration of total personality of your life with your spiritual aspects. And this is a good graph here because it really shows you and breaks down the actual organs and the parts that connect with it. So what is the root of the word chakra? Where we throw this around so much. I was raised Hindu and you know how the Hindu text on the Upanishads actually in 100 BC to 300 AD was the first time, well, one of the first times, actually the first time, taking a pause here, that we hear about the chakra system was around 1500 to 1000 BCE. Okay, then we see it again around 1500 years later in 100 BCE to 300 CE. And the term chakra, I was born and raised Hindu, but every single person that I, I was around a lot of Indian people, right? My whole childhood, up until the time I could go and do my own thing, I was going to Indian events, temple stuff. Not once did anybody talk about chakras, right? Even though it was such a huge component to it. But we hear that term a lot when it comes to evolution of consciousness. So what is this? The chakras were originally known as chakras. There was no H. And can be found in the early Vedic text, the Rig Veda, believed to have originated around 1500 to 100 BCE, depending on who you ask. Because some people say, oh, it's thousands of years older than that. But it looks like the information was definitely thousands of years older, but it was passed down verbally and probably written down, maybe not for the first time, but definitely written down in a place that we've now rediscovered about 1500 years BCE. Kakra, as it appears in the Rig Veda, simply means wheel, disc, or circular. That's what Kakra means in Sanskrit. When I first heard about chakras, I just thought that they were metaphysical energy centers, metaphysical points of energy in our body, seven of them, and the energy flows out of there. It's like some other dimensional world until I came across this graph here. And this showed me that actually there are areas in our spine. So let's just hopefully you can see my cursor here. Do you see these outpour of nerves in every area? There's this one right here. There's one right here. 
There's one right here, one right here, one right here, one right here. Well, there are actually areas in our spine called the neural foramen that are the exact areas that the chakras are located. So the chakras, guys, are not metaphysical energy centers. They're physical areas that exist that probably, that definitely connect to spiritual metaphysical energy centers, but they're actually physically in our spine. So let's just track this here, okay? So we have a brain. Our brain is producing this electrical current with this form of acid that's in our brain. The electrical current goes down into the nervous system and sends electrical frequencies to each part where the neural formins are, pumping every organ in our body, giving it the electrical current needed to exist, just like a car battery, just like a regular, any type of battery. Our brain is the battery, the electrical current are the wires, right? Of, of, of the outlet, or like, let's see, um, yeah, just the electrical current flows down, goes through the wires, which are our nervous system, and then it goes to every organ and pumps. You may have heard the term that they don't consider you dead, passed away, transitioned, right? Unless you are brain dead. Why is that? Well, when the brain stops functioning, the electrical current no longer goes through our brain, through our nervous system. When the electrical current no longer goes through our nervous system, then not only is our consciousness gone because it's not pumping anymore, but all the organs in your body cease to, ex cease to be able to function as well. Because if the organs in your body don't get, doesn't get the electrical current that it needs, it's not going to continue working. So the neural foramen is the opening between every two vertebrae where the nerve roots exit the spine. The nerve root travels through the reach to the rest of your body. Without the foramen, nerve signals could not travel to and from the brain and to the rest of your body. Without nerve signals, your body would not be able to function. There we go. All right. Now we've got all that out of the way. Now we're about to go into the ancient past and go on an epic journey to these ancient civilizations. But I'm going to take a moment here. And I want to take a look at the chat, see how you guys are doing, if you have any comments or questions or in this point. All right, you guys look like you're good. Okay, going back here. Yeah, leave any, if you have any comments, any questions, please go ahead and just let them know. Um, okay, Divine Essence. Wow, I never knew that about the chakras. First time someone mentioned that. Yeah. So to me, this became such a reality because of my physical, my need for understanding everything linearly in the beginning. I would do, it's really hard just to tell me something and me to be like, oh yeah, this is true, right? Uh, but when I start realizing that I can actually prove it and there are people that just accept it for what it is and that's their path and that's what their lessons are to people my lesson and my experience to people is to show people who maybe don't realize it that this is is actually a science that these are actually real areas and this is actually occurring that we do have these energy centers and the ancients knew about it so let's get back to this presentation ancient civilizations I actually have a presentation and it's on portal to ascension.org. Go there and sign up because you think our YouTube has a lot of content. Our website has another 6,000 hours of content on it beyond YouTube, but it's free on my, I think it might even be on Watchers talk. He has it there. Omar has it. I have it on my channel, but the full presentation is on uh, portal to ascension.org. And it was creation stories of ancient civilizations. Okay. Creation stories of ancient civilizations. I went through, 300 different stories on ancient civilizations and almost all of them spoke about sound and frequency even the ones where you thought like wait a second this is maybe not talking about sound but then when you read a little deeper and you start dissect um, um dissecting the metaphors you realize that it actually had to do with sound and let's go through some of them right now so sound in creation stories, many creation myths, or maybe the true, begin with God speaking or, sign, or singing the universe into being. That's a very common thread. Well, we have conventional science, right? 
a lot of people don't realize that the term for the origin of the universe is actually based on si on sound. Why do they call it the Big Bang? They don't call it an explosion. They literally call it by what sound it made, the Big Bang, because they also agree conventionally that everything started with vibration. An infinite singularity burst into infinite pot potentiality and opportunity, and it made this sound. But it doesn't even have to be an actual tangible sound that you could hear, but it made a vibration. And a vibration, we're talking in terms of it being a sound. The Egyptians, uh, the land of Kemet, they called and said the universe was sung into creation. See that very, very often. And then Hinduism, we have Om and the seed sound for each chakra. So Om, and some people are saying, is the 432 hertz, A, eh? and each chakra sounds to the, um, has a correlating sound frequency of that chakra. And here are the sounds of each chakra. And let's take a moment here because this is not just going to be an ancient history educational course. Speaking of which, if you want to know, um, actually attend the course, I have a four week course on this topic as well. And I'll show you guys that later, but we're also going to do a little bit of harmonizing together and not just getting information, but integrating it using our own voices. So we're just going to do each of these sounds here just once. Okay. So we have the chakra sounds. The root chakra, Lam, the uh, sacral chakra, Vam, the solar plexus, Ram, the heart chakra, Yam, the third eye, Ham, then the, uh, I'm sorry, the throat was Ham, the third eye, Om, and then the crown chakra is also Om. So I'm going to invite you all to either just listen or to actually do this with me. And we're not going to do what I usually do, which is three times each. We're going to just go through all of them and just follow me and I'll tell you when we're going to begin. But on the right side of this slide, you can also see that there are vowel sounds and the vowel sounds are even um, breaking it down to even just our regular to toning, the way we can tone. We can actually use vowel sounds like A, E, I, O, U and chant those in order to activate these energy portals within us. So if you're going to join along in this moment, I just invite you to Take a few breaths, just normal breaths, just center yourself. And we're just going to go right through this. And I'm going to say the sound, and then we're going to chant the sound. Then I'm going to say the next one, and so on and so forth. So the first sound we're going to chant is Lam. So take a deep inhale. Lam. Activate the solar plexus, the sacral, VAM. Inhale, VAM. VAM. Activate the sacral chakra, RAM. Activate your heart chakra, yam. yam. Activate your throat chakra, ham. Ha. Activate your third eye, Om. Om. Activate your crown chakra, Om.
this next quote here is one of my favorite quotes. Actually, I would think it is actually my favorite quote. I stand corrected. I have two favorite quotes. And the other favorite quote is going to be shared in the next three days as well. And this one here is from the Laguna Pueblo Native, Native, Native American myth creation story. Laguna Pueblo Natives. Okay. And this right here, to me, is a metaphor for the science of creation. So I'm going to go ahead and read this quote, and then I'll break it down. And then as I'm listening, as I'm saying this, keep in the back of your mind to try to dissect it from a scientific quantum physical perspective, right? See if these words that are metaphors mean anything to you in regards to frequency and sound. In the center of the universe, she sang. In the midst of the waters, she sang. In the midst of heaven, she sang. In the center, she sang. Her singing made all the worlds, the worlds of the spirits, the worlds of the people, the worlds of the creatures, the worlds of the gods. In this way, she separated the quarters. Shing singing, she separated. Upon the face of heaven, she placed her song. On the, on, upon the face of water, she placed her song. Thus, she placed her song. Thus, she placed her will. Thus, wove her design. Thus, sang the spider. Thus she thought. The center of the universe, she sang. The Big Bang, the infinite singularity. In the midst of the waters, well, actually, space is known as the second ocean, which is why the Navy, the US Navy, right? Let's just talk about that country, for example, has jurisdiction in space because space even now is considered a second ocean. In the midst of heaven, she sang, well, cosmos multiverse before anything was even created everything was just heaven all things are heaven in the center she sang in the middle of it all before it all began in her singing her vibration her sound made all the physical worlds the worlds of the spirits the worlds of the people the worlds of the creatures the worlds of gods we see this so many times the vibration, the sound, the singing was here before the gods. In this way, she separated the quarters. Singing, she separated upon the quarters, dimensions. In this way, she separated the dimensions, vibration, frequency. Singing, she separated. Upon the face of heaven, she placed your song. Upon the face of water, she placed your song. Thus, she placed your song. All things are a manifestation of this original vibration thus she placed her will thus wove her, her design thus sang the spider now we're getting into sacred geometry and fractalization when you see the spider being used in origin stories it's talking about the spider web and it's talking about the fractalizations of how galaxies are created fibonacci spirals and all of this so you can see we started from the big bang the original vibration and sound that came from all that is and then we get into fractalization and fragmentation. The dimensions were created from the same frequency. Everything is a part of the same frequency. All things that we think are separate from us are all part of the same frequency. And thus, the spider continued to create a fractal. And why did this happen? Well, why are we here in the first place? Source wanted to experience itself. Thus, she thought. Thus, source thought. How... I want to experience myself in multiple forms and multiple variations, even though truly I'm just this one vibrational frequency. How amazing. And the question now lies, what did they know? How did they know this? How did they create such poetry out of something so scientific? Even the Australian Aborigines, they speak of the three sacred songs, the song passed sung by the primordial ancestor spirits, who walked across their landscape, singing its landforms into being. We have the six days of creation, we have the six, six aspects of Om, the six ophasial tones, the six aspects of the all-seeing eye of Horus. And then a quote. A very familiar quote that you probably actually never heard of because it's from another text, not the one that you might be thinking. In the beginning was Brahman. Whom was the word? And the word is Brahman, the Krishna Yayurveda, ancient Indian text, 
predating um, um, Judaic, Judaic Christian texts. What does that sound like? Well, of course, in the beginning was the word and the word was God. That's from the Bible, right? The Old Testament, John 1.1. 1, 1. What does it say? Let's break that down. And what we're doing here is giving you context. What I did was I showed you about um, the universal facts. We went into some tools and what sound healing is and what we're doing now with it and how these are ancient tools. Now we're talking about ancient texts and the creation stories and how they had an awareness of sound. And now very soon, we're going to get into the actual ancient sites and what kind of awareness are embedded in these ancient sites when it comes to sound and frequency. And we are also live on Instagram right now. So whoever's joining in on Instagram, if you want to check on the YouTube, go to youtube.com slash portal to Ascension, and you can join in here on the actual live chat on YouTube. Okay, so breaking this down, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Well, what is the word? The word, of course, is sound, the vibration, the sound. The word was the word was with God, and the word was also God. Well, isn't that very interesting? Because something that I love talking about is how everything is paradoxical in the universe, in creation. And here we have the first paradox. Even this reality was created paradoxically. Not only in the beginning was the word before anything else, but the word was with God, whatever God is, source, creation, at the same time. But the word was also source and creation. So that kind of goes hand in hand with we're all one, but we're also see ourselves as individualized beings. He was with God in the beginning. This is where some people mistranslate. Oh, he, God, is just talking about Jesus or God. Well, he was with God in the beginning. What are we talking about here? We're talking about the word, the sound. The sound was with God in the beginning. Through sound, all things were made. Without sound, nothing was made that has been made. In sound was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That, so as you can see, sound all over this, right? And then the last part is really interesting. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light and the darkness coexist. Now we're moving forward and we're getting to the next level of this awareness, building up here, ancient Egypt. Let's go ahead and talk about ancient Egypt. And what I'll do is I'm going to talk about ancient Egypt and then I'm going to pause and look at the chat. So if you have any questions or comments up until now, go ahead and leave them in the chat. But over the next 10, probably 20 minutes, I would think, we're going to be into Egyptian awareness. Leave your questions in the chat and I'll go ahead and take a look at them or comments even, or if you just want to add some input here, we'll take a look at it after this segment. So ancient Egypt. Firstly, let's go ahead and show this video of Robert Schock, who this is at my Portal to Ascension conference, the first conference I did on port. Well, the first one I did called Portal to Ascension, I've done hundreds of conferences, but this one was in 2018 in Irvine, California. Um, Robert Schock was there presenting. And a little plug for our October 2022 conference, we're going to be in San Diego, California. Robert Schock will also be there as well, uh, October 7th, 8th, and 9th, 2022, which is what, like uh, 11 months from now, plus or minus a few days. We're going to be doing our sixth annual Portal to Ascension conference there. And in this one, Robert Schock breaks down why the Sphinx is older than we've been told. And uh, study the actually, Sphinx? Robert Schock is, you know, you probably heard that the Sphinx is older. Robert Schock is the key researcher and the geologist that really started this theory and started exploring it. You know, other people have uh, worked with him as well, some well known, some not so no well known, but he's really been the one pushing this awareness out. And thanks to him, we're really discovering that the Egypt seems to be around, well, some of the structures in Egypt seem to be at least 10,000 years older than what we have been told. So, Robert, what do you have to say for us? 
Oaks, my young me. And what we found is that we had uneven weathering around the Sphinx. What this suggests, that's not just suggest, I mean, it's very evident to me, the Sphinx was actually carved out initially on three sides. Then it was later fully carved in the back. This level of weathering, which is much more shallow in the back, is compatible with and compares well with the subsurface mineralogical changes. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about subsurface weathering that we have for other Old Kingdom, dynastic, fourth dynasty, tombs and structures that are supposedly contemporaneous with the original Sphinx. Does everyone follow? The fact that you have much, much deeper weathering around the other three sites indicates that this was carved out earlier. The body was carved out earlier. And actually what happens when you look there is that initially, do you see how you have the older weathering here? The Sphinx was only carved down to this point approximately initially, so it emerged out of the bedrock, and then I believe in the fourth dynasty, about 2500 BC, they were not carving the Sphinx originally, they were re-carving parts of it, including the head, sometime in dynastic times, along the back, etc. So initially, the Sphinx actually emerged from the bedrock, which is interesting because in the age of Leo, about 10,000 BC, when the Sphinx, the Sphinx sits due east, at that time in the age of Leo, what rose on the horizon due east on the vernal equinox, the constellation Leo. And when you view it from this vantage point, arguably it rises that way with the rump. You see how the rump sort of attaches to the horizon initially as it comes up. Now, I am not basing my dating on Leo and when Leo rose, but I think it's interesting that it's compatible and seems to tie in with my dating. My dating currently for the core portion of the Sphinx, the core body of the Sphinx, is about 10,000 BC. Why? What I've done is calibrate how quickly or slowly, I should say, the subsurface weathering will take place. So it's really based, my, the core dating for me is based primarily on the seismic evidence and calibrating that. And you can read about that if you want to in Origins of the Sphinx. I'll show a picture of that book in shortly. And I'm not pushy, I'm just saying that's where you get more information on this. But it ties in and seems to be corroborated by a number of other lines of evidence, including that we might be talking about the age of Leo. So we did other work. This is uh, another seismic map. This is showing structures under the Sphinx. This is, we were not looking for structures under the Sphinx. I was actually looking for subsurface mineralogical changes, weathering. But we found some structures. We found a chamber or cavity under the rump here. It turns out the ancient, the ancient Egyptians, the modern Egyptologists knew about that. Um, we didn't know about when we found it, but they said they knew about it. So that confirmed that the seismic work was good. We also found sort of a linear feature here, which is probably, I think, a collapsed tunnel type feature. But most importantly, we found a chamber under the left pod. You see the, this is the map of the Sphinx. So you're looking down on it. And this is her left paw. Everyone see? You can watch that full presentation, which is like an hour and a half long on portaldescension.org. Um, you know, sign up there and take a look at it. But what I'm, wanted you to really see there is that that you know we're going to get into the sound and harmonics right now of ancient egypt and their awareness of frequency right but it seems that there are so many different studies you know not only the constellation of leo being there but what is underneath the sphinx being much older a lot of ancient sites a lot of ancient structures including a lot in peru aren't were actually reconstructions of older sites but when the Romans went to these sites, when others went to these sites, 
you know, modern people found these sites in the last couple of hundred years, they only dated it back to the last civilization instead of realizing that there were reconstructions. Plus, you can only carbon date organic matter. You can't carbon date a rock. If you found a ship, a wrecked ship that was made out of wood, you can carbon date it because it's made out of wood, it's organic matter. You can tell how old it is. But if it's a rock or a limestone, the only thing you can rely on is if there's any text there. Uh, but even that doesn't even tell you the truth because the text could be there from the last people that left it. Maybe everything before that was wiped out. So a lot of people think because we're so advanced with sciences, as soon as mainstream science says, oh, pre dynastic Egypt, 3000 BC, everybody's like, oh, yeah, of course, these guys are scientists. They must know, right? But science is now proving that's not the case. Geology is a science too. And through that, we're realizing that it's actually incorrect. Now, there is a documentary. A lot of people post on social media tell me some things to watch on Netflix. And I'm going to tell you one right now. Add it to your watch list. It's called The Pyramid Code. It's around five, I think it's five episodes long. And, you know, Robert Shock's in there, Robert Baval, John Anthony West, a lot of amazing people. And in this, they sh really show you a lot of information in regards to pyramids and just, you know, around the world, really, but definitely a lot to do with Egypt that will just blow your mind. You know, for example, every single rock added in the um, one of the pyramids on the Giza Plateau is the same distance, light years to like the Syrian constellation. It's very interesting. But in there, there is this one thing that really blew my mind. <clears throat> so on the Giza Plateau, they have now found that underneath the pyramids, there are aqueducts, aqueducts underneath these pyramids. So you're looking at this, this image here and where this line is, this little rod right here, this little big rod, there is aqueducts over there. Now through geological studies, they track back where the Nile River used to be in ancient times in Egypt. They found out that from the references in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs and more, that the amount of years that the Nile River was in that position, 12,500, around 11,900 to 12,500 years ago, the end of the last ice age. The same dating that Robert Schock just gave us for the Sphinx. So what would happen is the Nile River during certain seasons would overflow with water. The overflow of water would go underneath the pyramids into the aqueducts. In the aqueducts, there are copper rods like this rod right here. The copper rods would pick up the electrical current that is created by the water flowing into the aqueducts, create an electrical current, and then go right up into the pyramid. When that frequency went from the electrical current into the copper rod into the pyramid, it became an electrical and a sound frequency into hollowed out tubes that made harmonics and vibration within the pyramid. And I'll show you one of those sounds in a moment. So it has been proven now without a reasonable doubt that these structures were masterfully created in a way to emanate and amplify sound frequency vibrations. And they created it in such an acoustic way without having to pollute the planet like we're doing right now. So the aqueducts take the water, the water hits the copper rod, electrical current goes up the copper rod, goes out in a hollowed out tubes into the pyramid, changing it into a sound frequency, going into these huge chambers where epic sounds would manifest from. And it's interesting because no matter what frequency comes through those rods, the sound frequency in some of these pyramids, or well, at least the one that I'm about to show you, the red pyramid, always comes out to be the same frequency every single time, no matter what person chants in there, what frequency goes in there. And that's going to come up in a couple of slides. So we'll get to that in a second. So here are some possibilities, right, of what it, Egypt, ancient, the land of Kemet, because Egypt, and I need to say this every single time, Egypt is the word that was given by the Greeks when they took control of Egypt, way after the original Egyptians were there. The land of Kem, Kemet, K-E-M-E-T. But the original spelling of Kemet was K-M-T, 
KMT. The reason why it was KMT is because the vowels were silent. They weren't implemented until many years later. So originally it was KMT, KMT, KMT. So there was a 2600 year, 20, 2600 BCE papyrus that states the Great Pyramid of Giza was created in 20 years. Well, there's an issue with that dating because that means the pyramid, since it, create, it, it contains 2.3 million individual blocks of stone, meaning one block would have to be laid every five minutes of every hour, 24, I think I was supposed to be 2.3 million tons, individual blocks of stone, meaning one block would have to be laid every five minutes, every hour, 24 hours a day for 20 years. The problem with that is each block weighs at least two tons. That's 1,764,000 pounds of stone being laid every day for 20 years. That's a lot. So then that's where all the theorists come in. Did they use levitation? Was there an extraterrestrial connection? I feel, you know, maybe ETs were involved in, in Egypt and definitely there's a lot of star beings and I'm going to be doing a conference on Egypt and the extraterrestrial connection next year um, within like six months from now. However, I also think humans were really advanced too. So there definitely could have been some sort of advanced awareness in science. Today, I watched a video um, on the info infographic channel on YouTube that I like every now and then. And they're like 50 things you didn't know about Egypt. And the whole thing was literally trying to disprove all the stuff that I'm talking about here. And one of it was like, contrary to co um, popular belief, but um, the Egyptians did use chisels in order to create the pyramids without any evidence. But I've been, I've sat through so many uh, evidence-based events and documentaries that show with basic chisels and, um, and the pulley system with the logs, it really wouldn't manifest and couldn't have been created in that way. So we don't have to go all the way and say, well, the ETs did it. Humans could have done it. Or maybe there was some awareness from an advanced extraterrestrial race. Or what my theory is, the Egyptians were descendants of Atlantis and they already had all this awareness. The Egyptian language also is created. So not only do their structures have a lot to do with sound vibration frequency, <clears throat> but the Egyptian language was created in a way to emphasize specific frequencies. Okay, even the way they spoke has something to do with vibration. Sound frequency is generated by aqueducts that turn into frequency when entering the pyramid, the one that it showed you. So could this be energy generating devices sending frequencies into the structure and for what purpose? What purpose? Well, these things were energy generating devices. It's pretty much been shown now. But what were they used for, right? And I'll give you my, uh, my speculation on that in a moment here. <clears throat> so could it have been a power plant maybe? Experiments conducted by Tom Danley in the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid and in chambers above the King's Chamber suggest that the pyramid was constructed with a sonic purpose. Danley identifies four resonant frequencies or notes that are enhanced by the structure of the pyramid and by the materials used in its construction. The notes start from an F-sharp chord, which according to ancient Egyptian texts, were the harmonic replica of Earth. His tests show that these frequencies are present in the king's chamber, even when no sounds are being produced. That's pretty genius to create something like that. They are, their, their frequencies range from 16 hertz all the way down to half a hertz, well below the range of human hearing. According to Danley, these vibrations are caused by the wind blowing across the ends of the so-called shafts. In the Yucatan right here, a lot of structures have been created like that as well, where they've created like wind tunnels almost that literally make the stone structures vibrate those frequencies, even though you can't even hear them all the time. This video, I'm not gonna show you because there's copyright on it. Don't want YouTube to screw me over with that. But this is a, a scientific experiment of the fact that we are now levitating stone. All right, now here is the video with Brian Forrester in the Red Pyramid on the Giza Plateau and what they found in regards to sound frequencies vibrating there. 
This is the entrance to the Red Pyramid. We're going down the shaft and we're going to go into these incredible rooms which are acoustic chambers. Forget about the idea of tombs, think sound, and vibrational technology. So this is actually inside, about 20 feet, more than 100 feet to go. Okay, now we're maybe a third of the way in. And Yusuf Awiyan, the dark figure, is about to come past me. Okay, maybe halfway down now, and the heat is already starting to to pick up in here, as well as the heat generated by uh, anticipation and awe. Okay, so we're at the bottom of the descending passageway. It's got to be 90 degrees Fahrenheit in here right now. And now we're going sideways. is tuned to A. That seems to be the sound that it likes the best. So I've just walked through uh, a short tunnel into the second of the chambers here. And the sides of them taper in with these almost baffle-like stones. And of course that is, it could be actually an acoustic cone filter of some kind. And the lighting is pretty terrible, but what you can see there is a massive crack in the solid stone. And that's part of the theory, again, that this was an energy generating device, as were some of the others of the pyramids on the Giza Plateau, and that they actually became overloaded at one point, partially exploded and then shut down. And as hard as it may be imagined to believe, we could be talking about that explosion occurring about 12,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age. There we go. So there's a few things there. No matter what sound, they weren't trying to do an A sound. No matter what chanting sound was happening, A for the third eye, the pineal gland, seemed to always come out. The way the structure is created is that no matter what vibration you put in there, it's created in a way to alter it to create the sounds that it wants. Like the other slide that I showed you where there was four resonant frequencies in the other pyramid and it would choose one of those frequencies no matter what vibration you put out there. But specifically in that one, it was coming out with A. So I'm saying A is 432, but we also know A as the third eye vibratory sound. And then the fact that we see that explosion there goes hand in hand with this theory. Humanity was at a higher state of consciousness. We're an evolved state of cycles, right? The yuga cycles. We were devolving in consciousness. There was a worldwide pyramid structure that created as Atlantis was falling. Pyramids were created all over the world. These pyramids were and structures were put on ley lines in order to harness the natural frequency of the planet to keep Earth at, the, at a great vibration that could create harmony in Earth. The earth continued to devolve in consciousness. As earth was devolving in consciousness, these structures could no longer withstand and exist anymore. A lot of them exploded and stopped working. That right there is the same thing. And then the last thing that Brian said, 12,500 years ago. Another, another piece of information pointing back to the same day. So now let's get to the A, the third I. The Egyptians were geniuses. I mean, not only did that structure do what we just saw, but they also created what we know as the Eye of Horus, right? And there's also the Eye of Osiris, which are just an inverted, the inverted of each other. And the Eye of Horus is actually a cross intersection of the pituitary and the third eye chakra, a gland in our bodies. So if you did a cross intersection of the brain, check it out. They created a symbol of an eye, they created structures that emanated the frequency of this area that could activate it. And 
they actually made it in a way that looked like what it actually looks like inside of our brain. Incredible. You can see here, like it's telling you the areas, the corpus callosum and the corpus callosum here, the hypothalamus, all these parts are connected. Amazing at art and they had some incredible insight. But what's even more is that their whole entire design of the Eye of Horus is actually based <clears throat> on musical intervals, vibration and frequency. The ancient Egyptians and many ancient cultures actually thought that vowels were actually too sacred, so they left them out. The vowels got introduced later within Eastern cultures, variations of chants for healing and spiritual ascension. So just like I showed you before, we had the land of Kemet, right? It was K-M-T, not K-E-M-E-T. We have the Ankh, it was N-K-H, not A-N-K-H. These were all added later as we began devolving in consciousness and the vowel sounds were needed to keep us at the vibratory level. Because when we're at those ages and stages, we didn't need it. Vowels were not introduced into spoken language until many years after we began writing and documenting our experiences on earth. This time around, because cycles of time, right? So this last evolution. <clears throat> so now I'm gonna go briefly, we're gonna take a detour here and talk about vowel chanting. But before I do that, I'm gonna pause and check the chats and see how you guys are feeling and doing. So give me some feedback, everybody. How y'all doing? Plus, I'll take a minute now and just breathe a few times, shall we? Integrating a lot right here. And there's a lot of information and I'm not even halfway and need to really work on my voice and not lose my voice. Because a lot of times when I do this, because the ultimate sound frequency presentation, this actual full presentation is four and a half hours long. And I've presented the four and a half hour version of this like four or five times. Every single time I lose my voice at the end because I'm just like, ah, that's too much energy, you know? So, so this time I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take it easy and sip some water. Hello, Angela. Welcome. Mafona, welcome. Thank you for being here, guys. All right, all right. Let us continue. Vowel chanting. Let's talk about the history of vowel chanting because today is ancient history 101. Well, actually, maybe like more like um, 901 because this is actually kind of advanced. But what is the history of vowel chanting? Well, in India, let's talk about India right now. Many have verbalized the sound of the universe as Om. The Big Bang occurred. And what happened after the Big Bang? Om, 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 Om. That's where Om comes from, everybody. The sound of the universe after the original singularity burst into infinite possibilities was Om. In Tibet, Buddhist monks created an otherworldly form of chant. Their attempt was to reproduce audibly something of the inner sounds that they heard during their meditations. They would be meditating. This is how Buddhist chanting began. And in that deep meditation, they would hear the sound and then they attempted to chant it. Even various Christian, Hermetic, and other Gnostic schools of Egypt also devised forms of chants that are perceived as verbally mimicking, expressing the real name of God, otherwise is hidden in the silence of the soul. In Scythian Jewish Gnostic text, which is called the Gospel of the Egyptians, there's an example of a vowel chant of Gnosticism, which is kind of a Western equivalent to the Om sound. Gnostic chanting chanted various combinations of vowels and have included them in their prayers. And here is the chant from the Gospel of the Egyptians, right? Vowels. I praise you. I call your name that is hidden within me. And then this is the name of God to them. I 
Gospel of the Egyptians and other Nag Hammadi texts have this in it. The long vowel chant in the Gospel of the Egyptians spells that I-E-O-U, a sacred name of God according to some. So we weren't even utilizing the vowel sounds because of how sacred they were. We were already connected to source. We remembered our connection so much that we didn't need it. And then as the connection started, we started forgetting our connection. Boom, we started implementing it, implementing it. And then we got into such a lower state of consciousness. We just forgot about the fact that we had it in there in the first place and the reason we had it. Look at the name of God in all types of religions and um and languages worldwide, and you'll see vowel sounds in there. For example, Allah, Allah, ah, ah, right? Ah is the sound of the heart chakra. So we created these for reasons, for a reason. And as I said earlier, Kemet was KMT, Ankh was NKH until thousands of years later. Vowels introduced into thousands of, year, thousands of years later. Now, here is what I usually do is we chant A-E-I-O-U together, but also I love to have interaction. So you tell me, should we chant A-E-I-O-U together one time each, or shall we keep moving on? So tell me in the chats right now, shall we chant A-E-I-O-U, or shall we not do that? That'll take us like six, seven minutes. Waiting for a response. If I get two yeses, then I'm doing it. Okay, let's do it, let's do it, okay, okay. All right, so since this is education and also a workshop, might as well go full throttle with everything, right? So something that we can do, and the way I like to do it is, you know, you have mantras, you have mantras like, for example, and I did this one yesterday, Om Bur Bhava Swaha, you have that's the Indian chant, you have Gnostic chants, you have Christian chants, you have all types of chants, right? You have English chants that we're doing now, right? Just saying, I am love, right? A lot of those are based on religious scriptures that created those. Then you have the chakra sounds, which is a level down from that, which is not really dogmatic, but it's been related to Hindu texts, right? But people use it all over, even if they're not Hindu. Then you get to complete non-dogmatic sounds and vocal toning. All of these can have same effects. So I love teaching people to chant vowel sounds because there is no religion involved here. There is no um, scriptural backstory to it. There is just the vocal tones that we can all make across cultures. So and just like the seed sounds that we did earlier, you can chant those, but then you can do this as well. And we're gonna do one time each, but I recommend having a, um, having a bad day, being in a funk, wanting to start your day out positively, wanting to just keep your vibration increasing, Chant these every single day, three times each sound. All right, I'm gonna do it first and I'm gonna do a shorter version and then we'll do it all together, okay? So here we go. This is how we chant A-E-I-O-U. And we're gonna do one at a time. We're not gonna do like A-E-I-O-U like that. It's gonna be one at a time. So A. A. E. E I I O O U U All right. So firstly, my microphone doesn't pick up low frequency sounds. So if I cut out, it's not because I'm messing up, it's because my mic is messing up. <laughs> it's not me, I swear. And um secondly we're gonna chant these full. We're not gonna do what I did, which was very light. We're gonna do deep breath in, full A, full E, full I, full O, full U, okay? All right. So like we did before, just get relaxed here. Take a few breaths in 
your nose, out your mouth, just getting comfortable. If you're compelled to join in, please do. If you just wanna listen, please do. So on the next inhale, we're gonna start with A. So deep inhale in. A. Deep inhale in, E. E. Taking a pause here. We're not going to do the U yet. Just take a pause for a second. Keep breathing normally. All right. Usually what I do when I do this is I ask people after every single letter to tell me where they feel the sound. But since this is a lot of information today, we're not doing that. But let's do that for this last one, okay? For the U. So we're going to do U three times, okay? U. You can sound like a did you do when you do that. It always, it always comes like a did you do to me. You. We're going to do that three times. And then I want you to post in the chat. And if you're on Instagram, post in the chat there where you feel that sound. Okay, where do you feel the sound? Because each of these correspond to an energy center in the body. But they also go to wherever you need them. A lot of people, 80% of the people normally feel it in the same areas. The rest of the people feel it in other places because it goes where it needs to go. But the sound you is almost like a full chakra one. So people feel that one everywhere. Cause look, listen to this. You're hitting different notes on there. So you're gonna feel it multiple places. So keep breathing normally. And on the next inhale, we're gonna go three times in a row, you. Inhale. Inhale. time. Open your eyes and then let me know in the chat, where did you feel that vibration? Where did you feel that vibration? And people in IG, where did you guys feel it if you did it? Let's get some feedback here. Anybody want to let us know? In my throat. Okay, we got a throat, center of the chest. Yeah. Upper chest, lower throat. Interesting, because three of you, you know, we have chest, we have throat, and then we have chest and throat, head down to heart expanding. Now here is the play work assignment. When you do these chanting, and hopefully you'll take this and start doing it, right? When you, belly, back of heart chakra, um, when you start doing this yourself, right? Try to move the vibration through your body. Close your eyes, do it a few times. The more you do it, the deeper you get, and then see if you can actually move the frequency. And that's when you get to another level of chanting. Here's just a graph real quick. Oh, we have someone on Instagram commented, yay, psychedelic Dharma says, 
the oscillating between crown and heart. Cool. So we have, okay, we have, this is just for you to use later. Not gonna really, don't really need to go over it, but it's about the chakra sounds and it's about what vowel sound you can use for those chakras, okay? So that's for you to check back later. Let me tell you something interesting. Did you know that the colors of the chakras were invented by a German in the early 19th century? That the colors of the chakras were never actually put um, in any ancient text. There were no colors related to it. They were created by a Western philosopher from Germany. Actually, it might have been Germany or Austria, I forget now. And um, that's in my other course, my four week course that you guys can sign up for. I'll show you the link later. I have information on that. But in that, they actually, the colors weren't even a part of it. So how interesting is it that we use colors, even use color therapy to correspond to chakras, but that wasn't even created from the ancient text. It's only less than a hundred years ago, but not until the 1980s did it become a defined thing. Someone mentioned it, but it wasn't even utilized until the 1980s. That's how recent it was for the colors and the awareness on colors. So I'm going to take a pause here because I think we're halfway into the whole entire thing. And I'm going to go back to talking to you guys about submitting your story and sound of vibration. I'm just going to take one minute here, okay? So again, everybody, I am creating three. It was my goal, right? I had a goal by when I was 40 to start writing books. I'm 39. I just turned 39 yesterday. So I was like, when I'm 40 years old, I'm going to have everything automated for Portal to Ascension. And I'm just going to go to some beautiful place in the world, check myself in there, the beach, and just write books. But then everything happened in the world. And a lot of my projects actually moved forward. And I started doing them quicker. So actually, um, within this year, I have three, maybe four. I have one entire book that's my book. And then I have three chapters that I'm right, I've already wrote for other books, right? And this is the book that is my specific full book that I wanna invite you to share your stories on. So even right now, okay, so say you, you just had an experience of sound and vibration and you felt something and you wanted to write on it, you can write and be a part of my book, okay? So this is called, and the link to this is on YouTube in the pinned in the description, pinned in the um, live chat and also in the description. But my book here is, as you can see, the sound one right here, Neil Gore. And I'm creating a full-on chapter, well, full-on main part of it, where I'm talking about all this awareness that I'm going over now is going to be in written format plus more in the book. But then I need 25 other people, 25 people to submit their articles. We've had five submissions so far, but I need 25 people to submit their 800 words at least articles or slash chapters on their experience with sound. Did you go to an ancient site and experience some solid sound frequency? Did you go and were you there like with Brian Forrest or another place where you're harmonizing instruction and it did something? Did you feel something from it? Have you gone to a sound healing event and had a, 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 an amazing experience that you healed some traumas, had some emotional perspective, saw something, had a past life regression where somebody had an experience before? A lot of people get those at gong events, the past life kind of experiences. Have you had any experience with sound? And I am, um, I am requesting in the most sincere and please, please, please format possible to really do submit your books, because um, your articles, because I need actually 20 more submissions to finish this book. And I have until December 31st before it goes to the publisher. So if you're interested in submitting your article, if one, you want to be a published author, right? then please submit it. If two, you don't care about being a published author, but you want to share your story with others and other people can read this book because this is going to go out to thousands of people and they can realize how sound and awareness is an actual science and ancient people used it and that people have actually having tangible experiences on it, right? So one, if you want to be an author, two, if you don't care about being an author, but you just want to share your story, uh, please do go to this website pinned in the live chat, also in the description, read here, check out the submission guidelines, click to add your story, you know, and check it all out. And I'll tell you guys again one more time at the end of this. All right, back to the presentation. So we did chakra sounds. 
we did vocal tones of vowels, but now we're going to take away vowels entirely. We're going to just do humming. Mm, just humming. You and I, we're our own biggest sound instrument. Sound instruments were designed to mimic the human voice. If you look back at ancient history, a lot of sound instruments were created to mimic things that we were already able to do or sounds that we heard in nature, like the didgeridoo. We all have the power we need in us to harmonize ourselves and tap into our innate gifts and abilities. We have three brains. Science is now saying this as well. Excuse me as I sneeze. <laughs> Excuse me. We have three brains. Our minds, our brain right here, our heart, and our gut. And they seem to have minds of their own, pun intended. Each one can be activated through sound and we can move energy to each one wherever we want. And let's just do one hum really quick, okay? Hum and try. So say that you don't wanna do any of that and you forgot about it. Humming has a great effect and I'll show you the science behind it. I'll show you the science behind it tomorrow. We'll do the humming science tomorrow with the science event. So I'm gonna skip some slides right now, but you're gonna get a sneak peek. So this is a great preview of tomorrow. Um, plus quantum physics and so much more. So let's try this. And last time I did this on my mic, it actually cut out. So hopefully it works. But basically you just breathe in and you hum. And I'm gonna do a hum in a way where I'm changing the fluctuation of it because the mic picks up that sound a little better. But this is how it goes. Mm. you're just humming you actually feel a little vibration in your nasal cavity right there so go ahead and try that right now take a deep breath in maybe get relaxed first deep breath in and just hum hum and try to move the energy around your body let's do it inhale mm. You know what's really cool about doing this event and presenting is that vocal toning, chakra seed chanting, humming actually has the reverse effect on you losing your voice. It heals your vocal cords. It makes you feel more energetic and able to communicate more. So since it's such a huge presentation, I got to talk so much, it actually helps heal it, which I think is pretty awesome. Here's the book, Humming Effect, Sound, Healing, Humming, Science speaking about it tomorrow. Here's the science. Try to get a quick glimpse, but you're going to get all this tomorrow. Humming and chanting, rewiring the brain, nitric oxide, more nitric oxide information, the studies behind nitric oxide and humming. All right, that was that. But I'll go over that with you guys tomorrow. Um, this right here is on chakras, but we're ready to chakras. So I'm going to leave this open. And if anybody ever wants to watch the replay or come back to it, you can pause right here and you can read this. What is a Bija mantra? What is a mantra? What is the chakra? We spoke about that earlier. But I'll add this to it. Some say there are 114 different chakras, but there are seven main chakras that run along your spine. These are the chakras that most of us are referring to when we talk about them. Each of these seven main chakras have corresponding number, name, and color, which is an within the last century addition to the specific area of the spine. Here we go. This is what I was talking about earlier. I get to tell you now. The colors of the chakras were actually introduced in 1927. A Western researcher correlated each chakra to a color of the rainbow. It was not mentioned in the original text. The colors have been a part of our belief system and chances are it actually works because we have made it that when we give meaning to something and we believe it so much, it actually starts having that effect. And that's what I believe is happening with the colors of the chakras. Each of these seven main chakras have a corresponding number, name, or oh, I rewrote that. And then not until the early 1970s was the full integration of a current Western understanding of chakras in a book called Nuclear Evolution. That was where our current understanding of chakras evolved after 3,000 years of the original text talking about it. 
just a little glimpse here of the chakras and the colors that we've we've given them now we've been we went on a chakra vocal toning tour but let's get back to the main topic of this entire presentation ancient historical awareness of frequency we are doing an event with michael tellinger this is michael tellinger's research on november 20th this saturday 9 a.m pacific on portal to ascension go to portal to ascension.org click on online events it's the first event we're doing one um we're doing a six-month ancient civilization series with michael tellinger you can you know register for all six months or you can just do one at a time and attend this one this saturday but this is part of his research he's going to be going into a lot of awareness on many things uh, you know south africa and beyond but this is something that he's really been known for as really the only person that's researched these so extensively these stone circles Adam's calendar is an area with stone circles, but there are thousands of stone circles all over South Africa, and then even going up the whole West Coast. Some of these are estimated to be 75,000 years old. 75,000 years old. Scientific evaluation has shown that the circular structures are energy generating devices using the natural sound harmonic frequencies that emanate from the surface of Earth. So these structures are energy generating devices. How does that sound familiar? Well, Egyptian pyramids, 75,000 years ago, why were we creating energy generating devices 75,000 years ago? We were primitive back then. Only a decade or so ago, we thought humans that don't, Homo sapiens sapien had only been on earth for 100,000 years. Now we know that we've been on earth for 300,000 years, at least, right? Um, but, 75,000 years ago, we've been told that we were really ancient, archaic, primitive people. How on earth <laughs> did we create such structures utilizing the Earth's frequency? All the stones in these structures were made of something called dolerite that is not even natural to the region. So there were the stones, they don't know how they got there. The shape of each of these stone structures are rarely specific, then none of them are the same and very unique because each circle represents the geometric shapes of sound, energy, cymatics. You may have seen cymatic plate, sand plate demonstrations. Well, this is it actually happening in nature. These structures seem to be taking the frequency of the earth in that area and creating a cymatic uh, physical manifestation of those frequencies that then harness the energy of that area and amplify it. And I'll show you how much it amplifies in a second. Also, some of these structures you go in, your phones don't work, compasses go wild. There is something going on with the magnetic force within this that is completely like, completely not what we consider normal. The theory is, and the evidence proves, suggests that underneath these structures are ancient gold mining structures that show evidence that these structures may have been utilized in ancient gold mining operation 75,000 plus years ago plus right because at least 75,000 years ago ancient gold mining operation what what was going on back then who was using these energy generating devices to create taverns or caverns underneath these structures that had gold within them to extract curiouser and curiouser the geometry of these structures are incredible. And here we go. Just like in North of Africa, where we have the pyramids and the Giza Plateau aligning with Orion's belt, we go all the way down South to Africa and we have these stone circle structures also aligning to Orion's belt. Now these structures guys are generating frequencies to this day that are in the extreme gigahertz levels, over 380 gigahertz, which are unheard of on earth in any normal applications. There is no normal application on earth that generates 380 gigahertz. So this vanished civilization had a really keen understanding of energy that we don't even know. And his brother, Michael Tellinger. Again, Michael and I will be together live on Saturday, November 20th, 9 a.m. Pacific. Go to portal2ascension.org, 
sign up there if you want to be a part of that one event or the whole six months where we're going to do ancient civilizations of the yin yang for the next six months all right let's go ahead and show you this one right here let's go to this the skin of the rock this brown reddish color that covers let me just give you some back story this right here are fragments of the stone structures these these things these sound the, these um what do you call it these stone structures right are actually parts that you would take out off the walls of the actual um adam's calendar stone circle some of them are found fragmented everywhere but a lot of them are actually just like part of the stone circles what is the rock that is no longer the original black or charcoal color the original color of the um the metamorphosized quartzite that's underneath and that's how it rings. I can actually feel my fingers underneath are deadening the ringing because I'm holding it and it's deadening some of the effect. There we go. That's better. That's what you want. You realize that this thing really rings like a bell and it reverberates for quite a long time. And Omar, Omar, if you're in the chat room, brother, please do go ahead and post the Michael Tellinger event for this weekend for anybody who wants to join in. Again, portalascension.org and go to the online events. But these stone structures, not only are they, we got three, three smoking guns here, okay? There's a frequency, we're talking about sound, from the earth. These stone structures are taking the frequency of the earth and creating the physical visual representation of it. These structures are energy generating devices taking the frequency and exponentially increasing it to 380 gigahertz, part two. These stone structures have these stones within them that ring like harmonic bells, part three. Sound, sound, sound. Now let's go over to another part of the world, shall we? And um, in two weeks from now, I'm going to do a full presentation on this place in India called Hampi, India. I have a whole hour long presentation just on these two slides. Okay. So stay tuned for that. It's really awesome. Um, so there's a place in Hampi, India, and you can see the map of India. This is actually where I'm from right here, guys. See this Punjab, Jaipur right at the top. I'm not from there. I'm like right here. Well, I'm not from there. My parents are from there. And I was born in England, but right here, there's a place called Hampi, India, not too far from Goa. Okay. See Goa, you probably heard of Goa and there's this temple there. This temple is dedicated to the deity called Vitala, Vitala. And Vitala, oh, there's, here's the temple again, very beautiful, incredible engineering. A lot of these pieces, this right here created from one single block of stone. They didn't create little pieces instead. One single block of stone. So Vitala is actually a hybrid god. It's two gods that became one. There is basically it's the two creative forces of the universe, right? We actually have the Trinity. You see the Trinity in a lot of ancient religions, right? Ancient scriptures. You have the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, right? You see the three, a lot of places. The three becomes the one. In the Hindu text, you have the three becomes the one as well, right? Over another similarity to, her, to other religions in the world. You have um, Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma. Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma, the three, right? Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma combined creates Brahman, Brahman, right? With an N at the end. So Brahman is the one all-seeing source of it all. Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma are the three creator energies that came from the original source that manifested all things that we know. So, which goes to the whole fact that a lot of Hindus don't believe it's a polytheistic religion, it's a monotheistic religion, because the only thing that exists is Brahman and everything else is a reflection of the one. So we have this temple in the Hampi called the Vitala temple. And as I said, Vitala is a deity that is Shiva, 
and Vishnu combined. So as you can see, Shiva plus Vishnu equals this guy here right at the bottom, this androgynous being really. And Shiva has a, has, um, a drum. Shiva goes around with the drum and the drum is known to make the sound Om. Well, Vishnu has a conch, but the frequency that comes from the conch is also the sound Om. So together they put their frequencies together and they create this drum and this conch like sound that is a frequency that creates their hybrid being, which is Vitala. <clears throat> this temple was constructed during King Davaria's II reign around 1442 CE to 1446 CE. So not too long ago in the whole uh, history of ancient India, right? At this place, there is something called the musical pillars of the Ranga Mantapa. The Ranga Mantapa is one of the main attractions at the temple. The large Mantapa is renowned for its 56 musical pillars. These musical pillars are known as the Saregama pillars. So we have the sophagial tones, right? The sophagial in the Western world, right? Pythagorean, Pythagoras being the discoverer, let's just say, not the founder because these tones are primordial, the discoverer of the Western music scale. So, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. So, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, right? Sophagio. Well, the Indian scale also has their own component of that, and it's called the Saregama. Saregama, Saregama, Saregama. So, these pillars are known as the Saregama pillars, and the Saregama scale actually connects to our chakra points. These are another way to activate energy centers in the body. These musical pillars are incredible because there's 56 of them. Some of them have been, you know, when the British came in there, they basically um, cut some of them down to figure out what they were. But some of them are like string instruments, like drums, different sounds, but they all go with the same exact scale from lower frequency to the higher frequencies. And here is a video of that. So these pillars were designed to imitate the sound of different instruments, including drums and string instruments. No matter what instrument is sounded like, each pillar followed the same exact notes of the Indian classical scale. String instruments, drum instruments, each of those pillars, you're playing it, it sounds like a violin. You're playing it, it sounds like a drum. The tone coming out from the exact same areas on every pillar, same exact tones, frequencies. Each sound is a journey from the root chakra to the crown, connecting you to the divine by listening to the frequencies. And just like in Egypt, when the wind, just like in Palenque, when the wind goes into these structures, and then all of a sudden, um, the frequency is still being played, even though you can't hear it, that's happening there as well. So the whole thing was, this was dedicated to a deity, to a god, to higher consciousness, to enlightenment. So when the wind will come through, when the rain will come through, when they would just play it themselves, there was always that frequency that was a full chakra activation within that temple. When the British went there, they were amazed and they wanted to know how were these structures created? How did they do this? So they cut a few of them open, right? But when they cut a few of them open, it was just pure rock. There was no difference. They had no idea how it was done. The, like every one of them looked the exact same inside. And here's the Sarigama scale in relation to the connection to your chakras.
Speaking about Palenque, now this, these are all my own images and videos because uh, Palenque is awesome. For the last, not last year, but the year before and the year before that, I was at Palenque on my birthday both times, which is another symbolic thing because my birthday was yesterday. So two years ago and three years ago to the day I was at Palenque. And um, there is some amazing information coming out of Palenque that connects us to the fact that the Maya had a really advanced knowledge of sound awareness as well. In Palenque, there are two areas. So when you go to this site in Chapas, right, which is about maybe like a six hour drive from where I'm at right now, seven, six, seven hour drive. When you go there, you can go and pay for entrance to this site, the excavated area, right? There's a lot more to this. Or you can go into the area where there's unexcavated. Palenque is massive. There's over 1,400 unexcavated pyramids and temples in Palenque. So you can go down over to a hike through the jungle where you're walking over the 1,400 plus unexcavated temples, or you can go to the excavated area or both. So the last time we went two years ago to the day, two years and one day ago, we went over to the unexcavated area. And this is, um, this is just for fun to show you kind of like, you know, us hiking in that area. Stairs of a pyramid. And you can see it because it elevates. ¿Cuántos pirámides temples? 1473 1473 1473 unexcavated pirámides pirámides in um in this area right here and here's one of them wow just wonder what's inside these things we talked on this thing. So we're climbing up the steps of the unexcavated pyramid now. Oh, just rained the last three days, so it's extremely slippery. Entonces estas piedras son este. So these rocks are actually pyramid rocks. Okay, jump it forward. So Palenque, it was known as a central hub for trade, commerce, diplomacy, and foreign affairs. Many different ethnic groups seem to have gone there, seem to be much older than we've been told, and that it was a hub for um, welcoming people from around the world that were traveling and discovering this area and having conversations about their cultures. It may have been an area for global affairs, global affairs, and great minds and cultures to share ideas. There's a pyramid structure there that was specifically for all the intellectuals, scientists, mathematicians, and astronomers, right? The elite of society, but not elite in a way that we look at it now, like uh, basically you're less than, we're gonna lie to you, politics is BS, all that stuff. I'm talking about the people that helped design and engineer the Mayan society in the ancient, ancient times, right? So in, in this place, this is the top of that one structure. Right, we had to climb a bunch of stairs to get there. And in there, this is the area that a lot of these great minds would gather. Not only would they live in this structure, the houses are right behind it over here. You can see this area that's kind of you know, off. Um, but they would get together here and have conversations about building society. So let's take a look at this video. All right, so last time we're here, we can't, unfortunately we can't go into that side right now. It's closed off for some reason. But you see that slab right there and the slab on the right hand side those are actually part of the roof originally this whole thing had a roof over it and even though they're solid rock and we have a clip that i'm gonna look for at home see if i can plug it in here uh, when you hit those rocks they make these harmonics these beautiful harmonics where as when they were over here and as the roof when they were part of the roof when it would rain when there would be wind and this is like a wind tunnel like wind would literally come through here um, just the way it's structured that they would make harmonic sounds on there and then we would have all the ancient cultures around this area right here 
um, getting together to discuss politics, science, astronomy, spirituality, all of that stuff. And at the same time as they're doing that, whenever the wind will come through and it would rain, it would create these frequencies that will basically bombard all these people in here. So the theory is that we both have is that those frequencies were harmonics that were designed to uplift, enlighten, activate chakras. There's a chakra symbol here. Um, and many other cultures in the ancient past had similar structures that also had a harmonics that was specifically designed to create that frequency within them. Whereas in India, for example, we actually have pillars that were made to give you the same sounds as the solfejos, which in Indian scriptures are actually saregama and not, not so remi da, which... All right. So that structure that which I showed you right here, right here, those slabs were a part of the roof. These slabs do the same thing as the humpy pillars. You play them, drums, harmonics, the same thing as the stones that Michael Tellinger pulled out of those um, stone circles. And what would happen when the wind would come through? Look at these wind. See the way they made the windows? Perfectly channeled the energy. It was hot there, right? They perfectly channeled it to create a good ventilation system acoustically. They didn't need central AC. They knew how to create structures in order to do that. And these stone structures were always emanating the frequencies because of the way the wind was hitting it. When it would rain or other things would happen, you would actually visual, um, you would actually physically hear the sounds from these now they're slabs because the roof caved in, but that's it right there. I had a video a while ago of us the year before that playing it, but I can't find it. I have too many video clips to go through. Just a few other <clears throat> ancient stories of levitation. We have the Pumu Punko blocks, H blocks. A lot of you probably seen. Um, the local legend is that these were actually levitated into place. <clears throat> We have Stonehenge, and there's two distinct stories. There's probably more than that, but there's two common stories that people are sharing about how Stonehenge was created. First of all, they don't really know how it was. All what the way we see Stonehenge, the way we put it together, was done by humans because these stones are everywhere. So it might even look much different. <clears throat> Stonehenge local legend says transported by levitation, and then there's another one that says it was done by giants. So this and or that. All right, County Meat Ireland. And what I'm going to do now, actually, before we go to County Meat Ireland, I'm going to pause once more again, take a look at the chat, see how y'all feeling, see if you have any comments and questions. And I'm going to go ahead and switch off the Instagram feed that's been going on for quite some time here. So here's everybody on Instagram. Bye, everybody on Instagram. Come to YouTube if you want to come uh, and watch the rest of it. Um, and hopefully we'll see you here. Let's see how I do this though. Cool. So how are you guys doing? Both levitate and giants. How about, how about what Bethany? Do I think, okay, Terry, what do you mean, do I think it was galactic? Well, what are you speaking about exactly there? Oh yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's why, I, okay, so Bethany's saying, how about both? And if you saw my slide, going back to the presentation, that's exactly what I actually say. I say, Oh yeah, doing a whole thing on ancient Ireland. They can be whole three hour presentations on every place in the world, right? So check it out. Stonehenge logo says transported by levitation and or giants. You know, this is crosses over. Who really knows? Oh, hopefully somebody knows. Well, oh, the Akashic records know. Now, County Meath, Ireland. In County Meath, Ireland, there's a 5,000, this is actually one of my favorites, Malta and this place. There's a 5,000 year old structure found to be amplifying the earth's natural magnetic frequency in the area, which is 110 Hertz. <clears throat> it was built around 3,200 BC, which is what, 5,000 years ago. In what we call the Neolithic period. It was the last part of the stone age 
but is an older than Stonehenge. So they say, but I think that's probably incorrect too. I think Stonehenge is much older. This is what it looks like. Amazing structure. So this structure is emanating a frequency, the Earth's magnetic frequency of 110 Hertz. And then we go to the island of Malta, which is a place I hope to go live at in a year or two for a, at least six months. In February 17th of 2012, Vancouver Archaeoacoustics Convention, in which archaeologists, anthropologists, and scientists got together to discuss the sound and resonance properties of ancient sites. So it was a mainstream event where this happens. People get together. They can, you can't deny that these structures emanate frequencies or have some vibratory awareness in mind. So they've created conventions to look into that. It's called archaeoacoustics. They went to Malta and they tested the frequency and discovered the caves in Malta that you see below here resonated at, here we go again, 110 hertz. 110 hertz means 110 times per second. So 110 hertz. They did EEG tests to see what part of the brain responds to 110 hertz. They discovered that it stimulates the area responsible for visuals and creativity. Some participants who are part of the study claim to have an out-of-body experience. There's actually a show on ancient aliens called the alien frequency, and it's all about 110 hertz. Like, that's how common it has got out now that people can deny that there's this frequency that's 110 hertz and it's doing something. Researchers detected the presence of a strong double resonant frequency. Another thing, we see double octaves and multiple frequencies created from a lot of structures. And we have a 70 Hertz and 114 Hertz as well. But the standard default frequency, 110 Hertz. There's an archeologist named Fernando Coibra. He said that he felt the sound crossing his body. So he went into the island, the caves in the island of Malta with his team of people, right? And he said he felt sound. Okay, these are not spirit. Okay, everybody's spiritual, right? But these aren't people actively pursuing this awareness like we are. Okay, they're conventional scientists. Fernando Coibra said that he felt the sound crossing his body at a high speed, leaving a sensation of relaxation. When it was repeated, the sensation returned, and he also had the illusion that the sound was reflecting from his body to the ancient red ochre paintings on the wall. One can only imagine the experience in antiquity, standing in what must have been someone odorous, dark, and listening to ritual chanting while low light flickering over the bones of one departed loved ones. They found a lot of remains in there. In the publication from the Conference on Archaeoacoustics, which sparked the study of Dr. Paolo, whatever his last name is, <laughs> reports on tests conducted at the Clinical Neurophysiological Unit at the University of Trist in Italy, each volunteer has their own individual frequency of activation, always between 90 and 120 Hertz. Those volunteers with a frontal lobe prevalence during the testing received ideas and thoughts similar to what happens during meditation. While those with occipital lobe prevalence visualized images, he goes to unto state under the right circumstances, ancient populations were able to obtain different states of consciousness without the use of drugs or other chemical substances. All right, I'm gonna break this down because this is another one that has like four or five things that they're saying that just validates everything that we, we discuss all the time here at Portal to Ascension. First of all, again, these are conventional mainstream people. They're not looking to go there for a spiritual experience. They're trying to do a linear test to see what's going on. The archeologists, I felt like I was leaving my body, a sensation returned. I had the illusion that sound was reflected from my body to the red ancient ochre paintings on the walls. Wow. And then there are bones there, almost like they're using this frequency to create a, a portal for their, for their ancestors to leave into another world. First of all, we don't know if the people that originally created this structure were the ones that left the bones there, or if it was created for another reason hundreds of thousands of years before and then later another civilization came and they started burying the dead there because they thought it was the perfect gateway to another dimension another the afterlife if you will so then we go here in each volunteer that came in to test 
had their own frequency of activation at these different vibrations in between them. Depending on the way your brain was structured, occipital lobe prevalence or frontal lobe prevalence, this right here is a smoking gun for plant medicine experiences. If you've ever had a plant medicine experience and you don't see things, it's because you have one or the other prevalence. If you see visuals over feelings, it's because of your prevalence of your frontal and occipital, occipital lobe, okay? So under the right circumstances, these frequencies will get people to different states of consciousness without having to use anything except the fact that they made a structure that emanates these vibrations. Physics.org. So right now in my book, well, actually, at least for 12 years in my book, there's so much research and evidence from ancient scriptures and scientific evaluation of ancient sites and that prove that there was an advanced understanding of sound and vibration by the ancient people. Not every ancient culture, maybe a lot of them, maybe there was a time where all of them did, right? But a lot of ancient civilizations that we're finding new, some advanced awareness. So to me, it's harder to disprove that ancients had an advanced awareness of vibration than it is harder to prove it. So if somebody goes to me, no, you're wrong. I'll be like, well, disprove it. This Disprove that the ancients didn't have an advanced awareness of sound. Uxmal, Mexico, my second home. In Uxmal, there's also a great um, awareness of acoustics in the way these structures are created. When you're in one side of the structure and you whisper, someone can hear you on the other side. When you clap, the vibration is just comes back to you. So it's been created in such a really beautiful, genius way. So the Mayans had a really great understanding of acoustics in a lot of different areas when you clap, things like that. There's some echo back, feedback. Plus when there's like only a few people here. And then if she's up there and I'm over here and she like whispers, I can hear her. Priestess temple. All right, here we go, guys. Precursor to the fact that I am going to be doing a presentation on Pythagoras. Let's just take a second here and show you it. How about that? Pausing here, going to my website. Oops, oops, oops. Un momento, por favor. Okay, so we're going to go into Pythagoras's life right now. Okay, just a little bit of Pythagoras. Um, because I'm going to do a lot of bit of Pythagoras on December 19, 2021. If you want to attend this event, Truth, Life, and Times of Pythagoras. Many years of research for myself on the life of Pythagoras. And it's going to be on December 19, 2021. I'm going to read, I'll just tell you real quick, I have to read this to you. Join myself for an in-depth exploration on the life of Pythagoras. We will explore the mysticism behind his teachings, what he knew and discovered about sound frequency, as well as his initiation into Egyptian mystery schools, who really was this person and the culture of the years he lived in. We have heard so much within the consciousness world and mainstream about Pythagoras' accomplishments. So let's dive deep into the man, the myth, and the journey he embarked upon that created such a huge impact in the world what did he teach at his university? And what was his philosophy on life and the cosmos? This is an unprecedented deep dive that will be sure to expand your consciousness and understanding of the history of humanity. So if you want to attend my event with Pythagoras and register, portalascension.org, online events, scroll down and you'll find it there, okay? And before we get into the presentation, I'm going to show you guys this again. If anybody wants to do their, all the new people here, people have heard it before, I'm going to say it one more time after this as well. So please excuse me for my, actually don't excuse me. This is just my passion. I'm so passionate about getting this awareness out that I want to be doing this a book where I have other people that are a part of it that we can all share our stories on sound and make it a collaboratory book. So if you want to uh, publish your article in the pinned in live chat, 
in the description, click that link, bookmark it, ask me questions. You know, if you want to like engage and be part of it, but you don't, or you have more questions about it, or you need someone to hold your hand to do it, I'll do that for you. Okay. So please contact me, info at portal to ascension.org, portal ascension.org. We got like 10 different ways to contact me there, call me, whatever, or just click the link and bookmark it. And please do submit some stories. <clears throat> So Pythagoras, Greek philosopher around 500 BCE, the father of musical therapy, but a resurrection, let's just say, but he's called that, right? And he um, had a mystery school on the island of Crotona. He taught the use of the flute and the lyre as the primary healing instruments. With his monochord, Pythagoras was able to unravel the mysteries of musical intervals. Pythagoras went to Egypt for 10 years and was initiated into many different mystery schools. He was provided with ancient advanced awareness from celestial beings. That's another thing that people have said about him and um, ancient scholars have said things like that. And I'll be talking about that in my presentation with him. Successfully connected geometry and mathematics to music because they are one and the same. The music is the creative aspect. Mathematics is the linear aspect. Just a different way of explaining the exact same thing. Thereby founding what we now know as the Western music scale. Pythagoras actually considered himself, um, considered that music contributed greatly to health. He called his method musical medicine. Now we're getting the sound healing circling back here. To the accompaniment of Pythagoras, his followers would sing in unison certain chants. At other times, his disciples employed music as medicine with certain maladies composed to cure the passions of the psyche anger and aggression. And we know him as the founder of geometry. So this guy that is so important to everybody in the world because of all the structures we create, bridges, all of this stuff, um, was into figuring out sound and vibration and frequency and how you can use it to heal the passions of the psyche, anger, aggression, and so on. He also, there's a quote by him or that has been translated by other scholars later that he wanted to find out what the frequency of God was. This is such a real thing that the elite, the elite worship Pythagoras. The secret, the secret, right? The stonemasons became the Freemasons. The Freemasons became the other secret societies. What were the stonemasons good at? Why was it that the stonemasons could go from um, from territory to territory with the guard of the Knights Templar for quite some time without being persecuted or anything because of their ability to create structures, right? That dated back to ancient Egyptian pyramids even. The elite, they worship him. And it's because the secret, that secret was how to create society. The mathematics, this awareness that Pythagoras had was hijacked by them. And then they became the ones that created civilization as we know it. So much so that check out this video. Oh, we're just uh, schmoozing all the uh, reporters uh, at the Emmy. Starting out with a happy anniversary to me and Jessica. This was our 11th Emmy red carpet. Yeah. So I think it's safe to say we've had hundreds yeah, well, of red carpet uh, conversations. <laughs> uh, but we've never had a red carpet conversation quite like this. When Empire debuted on Fox show was red hot. Now, series star Terrence Howard says when it concludes this season, he's done with acting, and that's not all. We woke to headlines about the conversation this morning. Howard Stern, no less, played the whole thing. Friends in the booth, please drop the crawl at the bottom of the screen. Take it away, because we've taken what Terrence said. We put the words at the bottom of the screen to see if we can all better understand it. Good luck to all of us. <laughs> Lucius is in the house. Uh, Terrence Howard here. You made huge headlines when you said after you complete these 15 episodes of Empire, you got to walk away for a while or forever. For good. I'm, I'm, I mean, everyone keeps trying to tell me, don't say it's forever. But I've spent 37 years pretending to be people so that people can pretend to watch and enjoy what I'm doing when I've made some discoveries in my own personal life with the science that 
you know, Pythagoras was searching for. I was able to open up the flower of life properly and find the real wave conjugations that we've been looking for for 10,000 years. Why would I continue, 10, you years. know, walking on water for tips the last ice when age. I've got an entire generation to teach a whole new world? To that, that's a big remark. Yeah. What, what, what do you intend to, to do? Well, let me put it this way. All energy in the universe is expressed in motion. All motion is expressed in waves. All waves are curved. So where does the straight lines come from to make the platonic solids? There are no straight lines. So when I took the flower of life and opened it properly, I found a whole new wave conjugations that expose the in-between spaces. That's, it's the thing that holds us all together. Okay. Uh, all right. we're I'm not going to show you more of that. I, I didn't look do up, it too well. Right. You can watch more on the internet. You can watch his whole entire presentation to Yale where he talks about this, right? So there, there is something going on, okay? And a lot has to do with Pythagoras, which is why I'm doing a two to three hour presentation on Pythagoras. Let's see if I'm going to do this now or if I'm going to do this in the next presentation. Yeah, let's do this in the next one. Okay. So I'll just tell you about this. Pythagoras theorized that the bodies of the universe all have their own frequencies and sounds. And he called it the music of the spheres. And now in this advanced age, we're now realizing he was right. And this is what I'm gonna, a part of the presentation for tomorrow. So I'm just gonna skip forward here. We're gonna to listen to some sounds of space. We're gonna to listen to some sounds of space. And then we're gonna go into sacred geometry tomorrow. Spoiler alert, close your eyes if you don't want to see this. All right, now we're back to ancient history. So we're going all the way back to Egypt, right where we began. The Ankh in Egypt, this is what the Ankh looks like. Some say, and this connects to Pythagoras as well, because the tuning fork was something that Pythagoras rediscovered an awareness that he got out of ancient Egypt. And it seems that this awareness was actually a part of the Ankh and the Ankh was actually a vibratory tuning fork that was utilized in different practices. Some say it was utilized during sex in order to take the energy and amplify the energy and the Kundalini force that you create when you have um, sexual intimacy with someone. So the Egyptian Ankh dates back at least to 9,000 BC, which is 11,000 years ago. You see, we're all going back to around the same dating for all of these things. <clears throat> the onk breaks down like this. N equals the wave and the sound, which is KH equals matter. So the onk represents the wave and matter combined. <clears throat> the A, remember the A was silent, represents Amen or Amen Ra. Each of the sounds of the onk, A-N-K-H, all represent a different deity or primordial force. Ah, Amin Ra, what is hidden? Because isn't that interesting? A was not actually pronounced early Egyptian days and it literally represented what is hidden. <clears throat> N is the wave, the frequency. K is the darkness and they had the God of darkness, which is the frequency within the dark universe. H, which is He or Hehet, the ruler of infinity. So the Ankh represents another genius creation and in every way, langu linguistically and design, the most ancient symbol of a code of sounds and primordial deities. <clears throat> so the Ankh wisdom was lost probably around 6,000 years ago as we were devolving in consciousness. And the Pythagoras invented the monochord, set the pitch to C equals 256, A equals 432 Hertz. And by being initiated into mystery schools in Egypt, he resurrected the ability to create tools that resonate sound frequencies for healing. Chakra tuning forks, if you go right now and you look online and buy a set of chakra tuning forks, they're actually tuned to the Pythagorean scale. That's how much effect he's had on not only spiritual realm, spiritual you know, communities and events, but also the mainstream. <clears throat> okay, I'm just gonna see how far we are in this presentation so I can know how to guide this whole thing all right yeah probably got a good 45 minutes left let's see how you all doing checking in with you all on youtube here comments questions anyone 
the Ra, loved them too. Lots of info about very ancient Egypt from works of Dolores Cannon. Yep. Masters of the Omniverse says, I see blue dots. And Bethany says, Freddie Silva has done frequency tone work. Yep, we actually have a three hour presentation with Freddie Silva on our website, portaldetention.org. And Freddie is gonna be at our conference in October 7th, 8th and 9th of 2022 in San Diego, California. So stay tuned, everybody. Um, this is gonna be a celebration of life. Like it's gonna be so epic. We're gonna be by the Marina in San Diego. Uh, we have a venue that fits 300 people overlooking the Marina. Freddie Silva is gonna be there. Robert Schock's gonna be there. Adam Apollo will be there, um, the Hertax. Uh, Michael Tellinger is the only person streaming in. Alan Steinfeld, lots of other people. So Freddie is amazing. Yes, yes. And you're asking about the temples in Thailand. I haven't gone, there's so many ancient sites. I haven't even gone into that one specifically. And Bethany says the Celtic cross also has the Anka corporate in it. That's interesting, yeah. Okay, back to the presentation. So now we're gonna do a little history lesson, if you will, or just explanation of sound tools, right? How do we start this presentation? Talking about sound and vibrational healing events. And how my foundation was understanding the ancient history and the connection to frequencies, what they knew about frequencies. So let's talk about some of these instruments. I think I just have three instruments I'm gonna talk about here. What is a tuning fork? It's an acoustic resonator in the form of a two pronged fork with the prongs formed from a U-shaped bar of metal. It emits a pure musical tone after waiting a moment to allow some high overtones to die out. <clears throat> The main reason for using the fork shape is that unlike many other types of resonators, it produces a very pure tone with most of the vibratory energy at the fundamental frequency and little of the overtones. So it's preferred by a lot of people who need that. Pure tone frequencies, no overtones. For healing, it's very specific because you don't have the range of frequency, you have the pure tone after the overtone dies out. Now the didgeridoo, my favorite instrument. The didgeridoo originates from Arnhem Land, Northern Australia, maybe the world's oldest musical instrument over 40,000 years old. Traditionally, didgeridoos were made from eucalyptus trees, trunks, and limbs that were hollowed out. Traditionally, the termite, a termite would hollow out the didgeridoo, and then it was cut to an average length of 130 to 160 centimeters. So didgeridoos, guys, did you know this? The original didgeridoos for thousands of years were actually not carved out by humans. Termites, even right now, it still happens, right, in Australia, would carve out, you see this inside? This is carved out by termites. And then the Aborigines of Australia would go and get their didgeridoo, create the mouthpiece, cut it to the right piece, um, right, right length, and now they have their own didgeridoo. That's how they originally were. But the very interesting thing is that these didgeridoos, for thousands of years until modern time when we can create our own didgeridoos and change the frequencies, all emanated the same frequency. So there was some sort of code in the DNA probably of these termites that when they would hollow out these eucalyptus tree chunks, they would all hollow it out in the same exact way so that when they were done, when you would blow through them, they would all create the same frequency, which was C sharp, C sharp. Today, didgeridoos are made from a bunch of different things. Right? Even crystal didgeridoos exist. But traditionally, they're used as an accompaniment along with chants, singers, and dancers, often in ceremonies. In many tribes, most of the tribes, if not all the tribes, I've only ever heard, there's lots of tribes, I've only heard of like one, maybe even two tribes that the women played it, but that might have been thousands of years later, right? Many tribes, only the men played the didgeridoo, and in other tribes, some children and uh, women did play. And the reason why is because the didgeridoo was a phallic symbol. It represent masculinity and it represent a rite of passage for the man. When you hit puberty and you were ready to become a man, you then received a didgeridoo. But the, some of the stories, because there's a lot of stories on it. Like there's one story that has, that the didgeridoo was given to 
the Aborigines of Australia as a tool to create a portal so that the extraterrestrial beings that they're in communication with could come through. So when the beings left the planet and said, they gave them the didgeridoo and said, well, this frequency here, if you play it in the groups, you'll create portals and then we can come through and we can give you downloads and information through your consciousness, right? That's one story. Another story is that when the children, what the stories could actually overlap, it doesn't mean one doesn't mean the other one doesn't exist. And then the other story is that the child would be given a psychedelic when he was in like the time to become a man, right? Probably around puberty. And then he would have to go to the wilderness and was not allowed to come back until he claimed his phallic symbol, which is the didgeridoo. And when he found his didgeridoo, he was allowed to come back into the community. Well, lucky for him, it wasn't that hard to find. So he's on a psychedelic, goes out there, finds a naturally carved out um, eucalyptus tree trunk, brings it back to the community, and now that's his didgeridoo for life, or maybe until it breaks. <laughs> but that's his didgeridoo, and now he's a man, right? So the word didgeridoo as well is a Western world given to the instrument around 100 years ago. When the British went there and they started hearing them play these instruments, they go, that right there, that right there sounds like didgeridoo. Oh, well, we might as well call it didgeridoo then, right? So, and I can do that because I'm from England. So I'm, I'm allowed to make fun of the English accent because until age 14, I had an English accent. And then when I was 15, I lost it because I'd been here for two years. <laughs> so like, so yeah. And I like to say that a lot is that because I really like to give the credit where the credit is deserved to the ancient wisdom because we're so fractalized from the original truths that we use these terms as if the, it, it was always like this without any realization of its history. So I actually used to have a graph, I took it off from this, but I had a graph of a hundred different names of the didgeridoo based on different tribes. If you really are interested, you can search it and find that yourself. This part, let's see if I'm gonna do it. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. No, we'll do that tomorrow. Okay. So what does this all mean? We're in the we're in the final stretch here of today's presentation. The Yuga cycles, right? The Greek poet Hesiod between 750 and 650 BC in his poem Work and Days speak about the Yuga cycles. Almost every ancient civilization culture pre-flood, right? Pre-Noah's flood or Gilgamesh's flood actually have references to cycles of time. Because let's just say, um, you're going on a detour here. Noah's flood occurred. We continue to evolve. Evolution was linear since then. We look at the past of our life since Noah's flood. And now we look at time and we think it's all linear because we were at um, the flood basically wiped out great civilizations. And then we had to start from scratch and now we're building ourselves up again. But you go back before the flood, all the cultures that existed before then, or the cultures that actually speak about the times before the floods, they realize that time was secular, right? The Maya, the Aztecs, the Indians, the Greeks, many different ancient civilizations that connect to that, right? Um, they knew time was secular and that we went through yuga cycles, right? The yuga cycle term comes from the ancient Indian text, but it's just cycles of time. The, there are two um, texts that really, really talk in detail about the cycles of time. One is the Greek text from this poet, and even Plato talks about it. And then the Indian text. The, in ancient Indian texts, they give you dates. And I'll show you the, the graph from this text in a bit. No other civilization in the world has the dates of the cycles, right? Only that text. So, but the Greek texts and many other texts don't talk about dates, but they talk about the characteristics of humankind during those ages. So here's what the Greek poet had to say. In the golden age, the golden age is the only age that falls within the rule of Cronus, created by the immortals who live on Olympus. These humans were said to live among the gods and freely mingled with them. Then we have the silver age, the bronze age. There's a heroic age that's in fact, it's a in between age, a lot of wars happening during that time too. We have the Iron Age, right? We have the Dark Ages, the Kali Yuga. Uh, so basically four main stages of evolution of consciousness. 
And here is one of the graphs that comes from the ancient Indian texts that show you the cycles, right? So the way it works is in one cycle, 25,000 to 26,000 years, around 13,000, 12,500 years on both sides, plus or minus, each age happens twice. The more advanced ages are longer than the darker ages. You can see here the Kali Yuga, the darker ages right here, are the smallest ages. The Bronze Age, you can see, the Dwarpa Yuga, a little longer. The Silver Age, notice the Tretta Yuga is longer. And the Golden Age, thank God, is the longest and it's doubled up. So you have an ascending Yuga cycle, you have a descending Yuga cycle. Each of these ages have their own theme. The Dark Ages, duality, separation, the age of authoritarianism, the age where you give up your um, rights and you feel that hierarchy is important. Um, and then you have the Bronze Age, which is what we're in right now. We left the Kali Yuga in 1700. You see this line right here? This line at the end of the Kali Yuga was 1700 um, CE. This line right here at the beginning of the full-on Bronze Age is 1900 CE. So there was a 200 year transition phase into this age that we're currently in. The theme of the Dwarpa Yuga is the age of energy. What happened in those 200 years? Discovered electricity. We're figuring out how to use energy. We're now fully immersed. As soon as we became fully immersed in the Bronze Age, what did we find out? We went even deeper into the realm of energy and realized quantum energy, early 1900s, right? It goes hand in hand with this. And then you go up, up, up. And I've, it uh, escapes me right now, the themes of the other ages, I can probably speculate on them and tell you based on my experiences of researching this, but there are actually given themes in these texts as well. And every age that you ascend, the life expectancy of humanity increases by like twice. So for example, we're going into the Bronze Age. Life expectancy within this age will be 200 years. Then you get into the Silver Age, it becomes 400 years. You get to the Gold Age, it becomes 800 years on Earth. And here is <clears throat> the graph with the dates. And you can see what I said, showed you here. So the Kali Yuga was a thousand years and thousand years, a thousand years descending, a thousand years ascending. And then in 1700, we officially started leaving that age. 1900, we officially started, enter, uh, we entered the Rapa. <clears throat> so you can go forward in time and see what happens and you can go backwards in time. So you know the date that we've been storing out a lot here is around 11,000, 12,000 BC, right? 13,000 years ago, 11,900 years ago, 12,500 years ago. So let's go back. Where were we in that time? Well, we we're in the Satya Yuga, in the spiritual age. What happened at the end of the last ice age? Well, the end of the last ice age was right here, around 11,500 BC, right when the golden age began descending. So it's important to note that in some of these ages, less cataclysms happen in more advanced stages because we have more control of our reality, but some earth changes do occur. And those earth changes happen even in advanced ages. And when those earth changes do occur, it has people need to adjust. So it's interesting that the Satya Yuga, um, the descending goes hand in hand with many of the ancient sites that we've been showing today and the structures created and the, explo the explosion in the ancient pyramid and all of that. When we get into these ages, war becomes more and more prevalent. There's war in the Treta Yuga, which is the Silver Age, right? There's war in the Dwarpa Yuga. There's a lot of war in the Kali Yuga. But the way war looks like, I did a whole course on the Yuga cycles and I'm going to Greece, everybody. I'm going to Greece. I'm gonna go live in Greece for two months from March until April, and I'm going with a tour in order to track the yuga cycles and the devolution of consciousness in Greece. So I'm gonna, for two full weeks, I'll be there. I'll be there for two months, but two weeks I'll be on tour from Athens, all types of ancient sites, and I'll be streaming live, and I'll be doing documentaries showing you the connection to the yuga cycles and its connection to um, the yuga cycles and its connection to ancient Greece, because that's where I'm going to be. However, what the whole theme of this tour is to connect the Yuga cycles of India to the ancient Greece evolution devolution. So it's going to be like a joint thing because the Greek gods have Indian counterparts. Zeus is Indra, right? Saraswati is Athena. Same person, same story. So 
not only am I going to do a, a full conference on ancient Greece, we're going to do an all-day conference on ancient Greece, but I'll also be there and we'll be going into this very deeply to explore, you know. So as we devolved in consciousness and wars and wars became more prevalent, the lower in consciousness we went, the less rules we had with, um, with warfare. In the Treta Yuga, for example, they would not behead you and put you on a spike and leave you in front of uh, somewhere to scare off the people. They would they would honor your own death. They would give you to the, they would give you back to your body, back to the people. There would be rules of engagement, right? In the golden age, it was completely different evolution of consciousness, right? But as we were descending and then all the separation it created, um, there were always communities within every age that decided not to awaken up fully, right? But then the higher in age, the fraction changed. In the golden ages, very few people didn't really want to focus on the spirituality. In, however, there was a baseline of consciousness that existed because of the vibration of the planet. And then when you get to the Kali Yuga, most of the people didn't want to focus on the spirituality, but then there was a foundational group of people that did that were going to be the spark for the next age, aka all of us right here right now. Okay, so every single age is not the end all be all. There's an opportunity for a complete liberation in every stage. You don't need to be um, a, a, a victim to any stage. These are the cycles that we can always break free from. Some of us are incarnated with complete different mentalities that don't allow us to follow authority and hierarchy in the age that we're in, for example. So as I was saying with the wars, as we devolved in consciousness, interestingly enough, every single shift from one age to another marks an epic war that happened on the planet. The War of the Ten Kings in um, the Indian text, the Trojan War. Track back the dates of these huge wars, and it happens to occur when we shift from one age to another. Okay, so then we, and I'll give you another example. What happened in 1700s? The American Revolution, right? What happened in the 1900s? World War I and World War II. The, that was the transition phase from the Dark Age to the Bronze Age. Okay, so I'm kind of going all over the place there because I get excited with this stuff. So this is the cycles of time. How does it connect to vibration? Hmm? Well, that's the whole thing. We're talking about sound, vibration, harmonics. Just like you and I um, emanate frequencies and vibrations, everything in existence has a frequency and vibration. And because of that, we're the planet, as well as the galaxy and our position in the galaxy, our position in the solar system, our position in relation to the black hole in the center of the galaxy, the supermassive black hole, all of those things have frequencies and contribute to harmonized or disharmonic experiences on earth. We have been in an age that has been predominantly disharmonic for quite some time. We're now going to a harmonic one. So right here, this graph really depicts our ancient, well, just this last cycle, right? Because it happens over and over, supposedly. Um, and some say that we're breaking free from this cycle and this evolution, right? So up, everybody has their own opinion on this. So as we're break, um, going into this new age right now, we are basically harmonizing the earth's frequencies. We're learning about the ancients and what they knew about sound. So why was it that a lot of those structures had such, and I saw somebody commented about the genius of this information of some of these ancient people. Well, look what age they were in. They were doing things with those sites that we were like, oh my God, how in the universe did you know how to create a structure that no matter what sound came in, the chamber would emanate the frequency of A, and you had the eye of Horus on the wall, but the eye of Horus is a cross intersection of our brain and our pineal and pituitary gland, but we don't see any evidence for advanced surgical, surgical procedures. How did you do this? Well, look at the age they were in. And that, my beautiful friends, is it for today. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a couple of things I've showed you earlier, just one more time. But um, let's just take the chat right here. Um, okay, somebody says, good question, Terry. So let's take a look at what question Terry had. What happened to come to material age? Well, that was the Kali Yuga is the material age. Um, Terry, what is your question?
Okay, should Ra, the same guy who built the pyramids and created the loved one, be punished? I don't have any information on whether a deity or an alien should be punished or not. Because let me just say this. There's two trains of thought when it comes to Ra. There's Ra, the controller and the and you know the one that utilized people for his own benefit. And then there's the Ra energy of Arcturus. That's an energy that comes in from Arcturus that the law of one also refers to that is supposed to be the angelic realm. So, and then that goes even deeper into is every deity that comes to this planet just playing the role to give us the darkness, but actually comes from a realm of pure light? Or are they stuck energy that are here to give us devastation because they're trying to hijack the timeline? And because I'm not like channeling, I don't really know. I can answer that question. All right. Any more questions? Or anybody? I don't see Terry's question. So, oh, here we go. Patriarch Omar. Okay. Yes. So ancient Egypt, um, when we go really far back into pre-dynastic Egypt, we see a lot of evidence for matriarchal society. There's actually a lot of um, st structures of individuals of actually women like deities with their hands on top of the heads of men, right? Which was a matriarchal society. However, from what a lot of people say is that it does, that did not represent control, but matriarchy represented balance. When we go to the ancient Lemurian culture, for example, you know, every one of these things is like a three to four hour presentation. But when you go to ancient Lemur, we're actually talking about a civilization that was really involved in the divine feminine energy. And we're like, basically like 13 year old children with divine feminine energy, but mature adults to be able to take care of society until the Martian um, community came that was a very linear minded masculine based society. And over a period of um, eons, maybe, I don't know how long it took, eventually took over the Lemurian culture and contributed towards its, its destruction. So yeah, there's been a lot of matriarchal studies. When I first got into all this awareness, I was wondering if we're so patriarchal and so wounded masculine, were they, are there planets where there was a, where the wounded feminine was in control? That was my question. I, no one's really answered that to me. So, but when it came to matriarchy in the context of ancient India, because ancient India changed and became ritualistic and became patriarchal. But when you go back into ancient cultures in India, you see like the worship of the, the feminine energy and how females were really held up as like goddess energy and they weren't persecuted and all of that. But over thousands of years, that got lost as well. Are these ages associated with matriarchal and patriarchal energies? So I would say, the if okay, let's talk about this. We're talking about instead of matriarchy and patriarchy, let's talk about feminine and masculine. Okay. So there's the wounded masculine and then there's the wounded feminine, which is not really, even though women are hardwired to be um, into the feminine energy, but they also are masculine energy and men are hardwired for the masculine energy, but they also have the feminine energy and the potential to balance both. I would say that these ages in these yuga cycles were more of a balance. We, we exist in a wounded masculine, but the, we also exist in a wounded feminine because the wounded masculine has wounded the feminine. In these societies, I believe the divine feminine and the divine masculine were very balanced. So it wasn't like there was just matriarchal. It was more of a balance rather than one energy being more than the other. It's my personal feeling here. All right, so... Now I'm going to do the final stretch here. I'm just going to show you guys the thing that I've been showing you multiple times because I really, really, really would like you to be a part of it. But before I do that, I'm going to show you my website here. First of all, if you want to be a part of the, forget these dates, this is actually evergreen course. If you want to go deeper and do whole toning exercises, go into 432 Hertz awareness, um, learn how to be a sound practitioner, find out more about ancient history, I have a four week course. Well, it's just four videos now because the course is over. You can go and sign up right here and I'll post it in the, in the room. Anybody's interested. Don't forget guys, I'm going live again tomorrow with the, the science of sound and frequency. Okay. So check it out. Sound of vibration course. Here is my Pythagoras event. Anybody's interested, but what I really want to show you is how excited I am for all the events that I have just scheduled in the last few days. So take a look at this. So, okay, to, uh, Saturday we have Michael Tellinger, right? 
So check that out if you want to join in with him, either for the six months or, or um, for the one class. On uh, December 11th, we have the Cosmic Christ with JJ and Desiree Hurtech. On December 5th, we're doing a free panel on YouTube with Whitley Strieber, JJ Desiree Hurtech, and myself and Alan Steinfeld on Jesus and New Vision, Christ Consciousness. So we're going to talk about that will be on as well. I'm also doing a free one on the pagan roots of Christmas. December 19th, Truth, Life, and Time of Pythagoras. January 8th and 9th, the second annual walk-ins conference. January 22nd, the Indus Valley and the Ancient India two-day online conference. Saturday, February 19th, the Sumerians and the Mesopotamia all-day online conference. Then I'm doing one on Galactic Origins in February. There's going to be like 10 of events in between these dates. I just haven't made all of them yet. And on March 5th next year, Ancient Egypt and the Extraterrestrial Connection. March 6th, Mysticism, Indigenous Healing and Modern Encounters with Other Dimensions. New speaker. And then this presentation, tomorrow's presentation, Saturday's presentation, plus another hour of information on March 12th. I'll be doing that one as well. And then Jamie John over in April. I'm just showing you this because I'm excited. I'm not like expecting you to remember everything that I'm showing you right now. But um, I, I created like a bunch of events yesterday. So portaltoascension.org, sign up there and get 3,000 hours of free presentations. And then get you know, emails and attend some of our events. That would be amazing. Lastly, and certainly not leastly, is really the reason why I wanted to do three days of sound information. Do you want to be in this book, guys? That's the question you need to ask yourself. And even if you don't want to be in this book, then ask yourself, do I want to share my story and have thousands of people read it? Then that's already another good reason to be a part of it. So in the description of the YouTube pinned over there is the, um, the link for this. You can click here and you'll go to this website and you can learn about the book that I'm creating. You can see these are all different books from different people. I'm going to be in, there's one by William Henry here on Ascension. I'm going to be in that one as well. There's one, um, yeah, that's the only other one I'm going to write in. And then here's mine, my little one in the corner here, sound book by Neil Gore. I'm going to do everything that you're going to hear in the next few days is going to be in written format for this book. And then your stories, 25 people, five people have submitted so far. Your stories are going to be um, published in there as well. You need to have at least 800 words. So go to the site, read this, click on submission guidelines, which is pretty simple. It just tells you, tell your experience, at least 800 words. Boom, click here. And then you can add your story. Um, if you thinking about it, just go ahead and click the link, bookmark it, come back to it later. If you have questions about it, if you don't want to do it, but you do want to do it and you kind of want someone to hold your hand in doing it, contact me because this is my number one project right now, even though I have like a million number one projects, but I really have until December 31st before this goes to the publisher. So I want people to submit their stories and I want to do something different. I want to do a book where we all create it together, you know, all the people involved in it, not just one person. All righty. Let me go check the chat, see how we're all doing here. Yep. I just, thanks bro, Joshua. Yep, nonstop, lots of awareness here. We do 110, for the last five years, I've done a, four years, I've done 110 events a year. And that's not including podcasts and other streams and everything. So a lot of exciting things to look forward to. Um, tomorrow, I'll be going live again, but an hour earlier, which will be 2 p.m. Pacific, no, 2 p.m. East Coast, which is 11 a.m. Pacific. And tomorrow we're doing the science of sound and vibration, probably go for around the same amount of time. We'll also do the science of the music of the spheres. We'll listen to the sounds of Jupiter. We're gonna to listen to the sounds of Saturn. We're gonna to listen to the sounds of the moon. We're gonna dissect sacred geometry. And then we're gonna look at um, quantum physics experiments and how they started to prove spirituality is actually a science that we're only now rediscovering. That's predominantly the presentation tomorrow is dissecting the subatomic world and the evolution of quantum physics. All right, everybody, I'm going to throw the link here one more time to the book.
and to say to you, I'll end with a, uh, with a poem here. I feel that's probably the best way to close this out. Because the spoken word is also a vibration, is it not? Let's do one that I remember. Ah, let's do one called Atlantis because we spoke about a lot of ancient civilizations and how they probably were descendants of Atlantis today. And yesterday we did a Crystal Skulls podcast. If you really want to continue having fun today and watching stuff, watch Omar, me, myself, and Joan yesterday. Oh, Omar wasn't on it actually, but myself and Joan on the Crystal Skulls interview we did yesterday. So here we go, Atlantis. So are we one yet? Going back to source. No remorse when reinforced the course that we all endorse. Unconditional love. The highest vibration a gift from above. Desolation of separation. We must be the ones to say this is enough. You see the third dimension? It was meant to be tough. There is no captivity, so unlock the cuffs. Move away from hate and lust. A thoughts begin to shift the earth's crust into straight axis. Just like in Atlantis, stop causing damage and learn to manage self-realization. When people start to vanish when we change our intentions and join the like-minded souls in the fifth dimension, this is the beginning of our oversoul mission. What is it that you envision for the future incarnations? The Christ consciousness has arisen. Tear the perception of being in a prison, this industrial system, slumber of opposites. Duality, where we got lost and forget how to circumvent and achieve liberation. The curiosity won't last for long at all. As you move to the aquatic age, break free from this third dimensional cage of limitations, Freemasons being misplaced in this illusionary reality. Governing authorities, there will be no more war. Co-create a love ambassador, open the doors. Life isn't supposed to be a chore. No getting on your knees, worshiping entities from the floor. The message is simple, man. We don't need to know anymore. We are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the ones that we've been waiting for. Thank you so much, everybody. Just let the comments come in as we close out for today. Infinite gratitude. We are all sound made physical. We are vibratory frequencies manifest into physicality. We are connected to the all, but we have this illusion that we're just our separate individual beings. And today, tomorrow, and the next day, we're going to go deep, deep, and deeper. Tomorrow, we talk about the science because I love knowing how this is a real thing based on the science behind it all. All right, everybody. Love you all so much. Have a beautiful rest of your day. See you guys tomorrow. Peace out.